What's going on? This is your man Alex from Alpha Destiny, and today I'm bringing you a live Q and A. Gonna be answering all your fitness questions for the next hour and a half to two hours tops. So I hope that it makes your good Friday even better. So welcome everybody. I know it's a little bit random, but it's been a while since I last brought you one of these, with the exception of the exclusive conjugate Q and A. And um, just in case you're wondering. Yes, this will be available for you to view after the fact, so don't feel pressured to stay with me all the way through. Also, the entire video will be, will be timestamped. So just give me a few hours after it's uploaded, and I'm going to take care of everything. So, let's get this started. I'm noticing concurrent viewers. What is that? Is this even going through? I don't think there's anybody in. That's strange. Oh, it's on private. I'm a fucking idiot. No shit. <laughs> uh, okay, redo, redo. What's going on guys? This is Alex from Alpha Destiny and today I'm bringing you an exclusive live Q&A. So I hope it makes your Good Friday that much better. So a few minutes before you guys came in here, I actually turned on the button and I was talking for like a minute and a half and there was nobody coming in. I was confused. I was like, is something going on? Are you guys just not clicking? And then I realized that it was on private. So my bad. This time we're public. I'm going to be answering all your questions for the next hour and a half to two hours. What's up, what's up? I see all you guys are coming in. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, last time we did this was uh, with the conjugate Q&A. And that was a one-time thing in honor of Louis Simmons. This time around, we're not gonna talk about that subject <laughs> when we move into Florida, my man. Yo, what's good? Danny, Big Owl, Johnny, Giorgio, Brandon, Colin, White Fang, yeah. Got a lot of cool guys, and we already got a super chat. John N. Casey Donahue has no gains. No idea who that is, bro. So, uh, a <laughs> lot private. I've seen that happen before, exactly. And yeah, guys, um, I'm just going to say right off the bat, I would actually prefer if you give less donations. This way we can make the chat a bit more organic in the sense that I'm responding back and forth as you lay out your questions. So it's not that I don't appreciate your support. Everybody here means the world, but let's just, you know, have something like instantaneously, you know, build a conversation instead of just answering one question to the next, even though it's probably going to lean in that direction to some extent. Anyway, uh, to repeat the message that was originally stated, which uh, you guys are probably not going to hear unless somehow the videos get fused together. This Q&A is going to be an hour and a half to two hours, and I'm going to timestamp everything after the fact. So just give me a few hours after it's completed. I'm going to take everything for you. None of you guys got to do it, okay? So uh, without further ado, let's get started, everybody. I mean, Alex. Okay, when's the new book coming, Alex? It's in the works, but it's a calisthenics program, and I have to say, it's probably one of the greatest weighted calisthenics systems ever invented. I don't say that to my own horn, but it's very unique. It's concurrent periodization. A lot of special exercises. It's going to blow your freaking mind. If you're someone who wants to get really strong at weighted pull-ups, weighted dips, weighted push-ups, and most importantly, get jacked out of your damn mind, basically body weight, bodybuilding, this is what's going to do it for you. It's not one of those systems where you're just going to be fit and have a decent look of physique. Like, no, I'm talking about appearing almost like a natural bodybuilder in the sense that everything is jacked from head to toe. So it's going to be truly revolutionary. A combination of gymnastic rings, weighted stuff, non-weighted GPP, everything. Periodized. Trust me, you've never seen this before. And I'll be the very first. So I'm really excited. But you have to give me a few months to perfect everything, okay? All right. Hamad M. How would you do nucleus overload on biceps? There's different ways to approach it all depending on recovery, but a really simple method that everyone can do 
is by performing band curls. So micro mini bands would probably be your best bet or just mini bands in general and just rep it out, right? Attach it to anything like a, a dresser or a bob dummy or a power rack, whatever you have available, just curl your freaking life away and um, do as much volume as you can reasonably tolerate. And then when your pump goes away, stop the session right then and there. You don't have to track progressive overload. You're just pumping blood into the muscle. Do that every single day, bro. So the benefit with the bands is that you're getting nucleus overload effects, but you're also going to hypertrophy the connective tissue. So if you're someone who has sensitive elbows, when you do your weighted chin-ups, regular barbell curls, anything, you know, you're, you're generally you're a little bit stiff. You got problems there. The band curls are going to accomplish that while at the same time getting volume in the biceps. So that would probably be my primary choice because it has been noted by many guys that when you curl on a consistent basis, you can start to get some overuse injuries. So this is where the bands would be perfect in my opinion. And best of all, all you guys are going to be able to do it. Otherwise, occlusion bands can work too. I know Megan from Team 3D Alpha is big on that. Or you can grab some super light dumbbells. So like 15, 20, 25 pounds tops. Keep the elbows tight to the side. Just rep it out this way, you know. No need for shoulder flexion. Just pump it, man. You're going to be good. So honestly, it doesn't really matter what you do. As long as it's a, a low stress variation, you can get lots of reps in without affecting your main workouts. You got something good. What's considered a fat bulk when you exceed 20% body fat, as well as the calorie surplus itself. If your maintenance is 2,500 and you're over here eating 3,500, you're messed up. That ain't bare mode, it's called fat mode. And the problem with this is that you're not gaining any extra muscle for it. You're just shortening the duration of your bulk. So if you wanted to bulk for six months, you probably have to do it for three to four tops before you cut again, unless you don't care. You just want to blow max, enter Kiriakos mode. But that's your choice, bro. All right. Super chat, Mark Alford Jr. Thank you very much. Hey, Alex, I'm six feet, 1.5 inch, 311 pounds. That's crazy, dude. About 142 kilos. My knees are bad, man. Would hamstring and glue focus take care of that? Along with losing weight, of course. My birthday is next Saturday, turning 25. Nice. 25, uh, 25 is the money age. So, at 311, uh, you got a lot of fat to lose, my man. That's going to be a minimum six-month cut, if you ask me. And that's probably the primary reason why you have knee pain. I've heard many guys your height get knee pain around 260, 270 if they don't have a lot of muscle paired with it. Now, you didn't mention anything about your training experience. And to that, I would say there are some elite powerlifters who are really fluffy. They compete as uh, heavyweight athletes. They're around the same weight as you, maybe a little bit taller there, but no knee pain whatsoever. So at the end of the day, sure, weight loss is going to be the biggest determining factor, specifically if you're a novice. But along that, you can do a recomp. And strength training is what's, is what's going to get rid of this pain. So from 311 to maybe 230, 240, you can easily burn fat, build muscle at the same time. It's not going to be a problem. you got all kinds of reserves. So it's not like you trying to go from, let's say, 220 to 185. So lean to shred it. You're going from, let's keep it real, obese to what I would assume is a lean weight, right? So in that process, you already bulked. In other words... What people describe as main gaining is applicable to you. It's not going to not work. So my advice, man, keep losing weight and strengthen your damn knees by not necessarily focusing on the glutes, but 100% to hamstrings and deep knee bending exercises. So I would actually perform regressions of the sissy squat. So Mark Bell demonstrated something very recently. It was a sissy squat with reverse bands. That would be right up your alley, my man. As well as, believe it or not, leg extensions, which we used to think were bad for the knees, but in this situation, it could be helpful. Um, then you wanna do a belt squat or hack squat or anything that is quad biased. As long as it's a quad biased movement and your knees are really bending a lot, so your tibia lean, when you look at the side angle, it's gonna be all the way forward. That's what's gonna build those, um, the joint angle stress in those deep positions. Then, of course, you want to supplement that with direct hamstring work. The legendary Louis Simmons recommended 
band leg curls on a frequent basis. So that could be like three sets of 33 every single day. You take like a, a mini band or micro mini band attached to a power rack or a dress or anything that's stationary. You lie down flat on your stomach, you leg curl that way, right? Or you sit down on a chair, attach it from in front of you and curl it, okay? All those things is what you need. So it's not only a combination of losing weight, but it's the strength training that complements this entire process. And I believe that by focusing on these areas, your knee pain is gonna completely go away. And by 25, you're gonna be looking better than ever and feeling pain free. And this will extend to the rest of your life because we don't have to be in pain moving forward. Anti-aging, training for longevity, these are all real things. And I know you got this, man. So I hope that was clear and helpful. Okay, David Samo Kyuk. Had piriformis sciatica pain for over a year. 8 out of 10 pain. Massage, yoga, physio didn't help. I started good mornings. One month later, I'm cured. Thank you. Whoa. Yo, that's amazing, man. Well, first of all, I'm happy you overcame the pain. Especially since you were dealing with it for over a year. And the fact that good morning solved it in one month. Like, did you find it out through my videos? I'm honored. And guys, this is really the power of good mornings. People think of it as a dangerous exercise because the long moment arm, right? But if you can get past that by dropping your ego completely, starting with say a 45 pound empty bar, or maybe even less than that if you're really weak and you work your way up, you'd be surprised what it can accomplish for you. So for all my OG subs, you may know that in 2017, I did some really bad ego lifting. And that was a time where I reintroduced good mornings. I was doing over 400 pounds off pins, but it was kind of a squat morning to be honest with you. And I didn't build my tissue capacity at all. Like I literally went, like I was under the assumption that, okay, I'm able to do 585 plus on hack deads and block pulls and all these amazing overloads, right? I should be able to handle a good morning with my body angle like this with like 400 pounds, right? That was a big mistake. Ended up getting snapped up and it hurt me for some months, you know? I actually made a video about that at the time to be careful of good mornings, don't fucking do them. But I was wrong. It's all about how you train the movement. So in 2019, I started doing them again. Started with 45 and I microloaded, literally freaking microloaded. Never added more than five pounds a session. And last week, I did 250 for three sets of 10. No pain, everything's good. One of the best exercises ever, man. So the only time I see myself dropping them is when I get so strong that I might as well just do deadlifts or RDLs to begin with. At that point, stimulus to fatigue won't matter. But in an absolute sense, if you approach it the right way, it's only going to get rid of injuries. It strengthens you rather than breaks you, okay? And that's what you saw with my man right here. So much love, and I'm happy you're feeling better. Destiny's 28% body fat? I don't think so, bro. Not right now. But you know, I'm weighing between 178 and 180. So I gained quite some uh, some mass, bro. You see my biceps? Whew. This is under shit lighting as well. All right. How do I get better mobility for deadlifting? I can't reach the bar on the ground without losing my spine neutrality. I have to pull off three inch blocks. Well, thank you for the support, first of all. And to answer your question, maybe that is your active range of motion in the sense that you don't have the best leverages for deadlifts. I'm kind of the same way. Like if I do high handle trap bar deadlifts, it's the perfect position. I don't lose tightness. I don't feel the need to round. I've pretty much never had an issue with anything that's above a two inch block pull. And the reason is that this may sound surprising, your boy has a long torso. So when I sit down next to taller guys, we're literally the same height, which is insane, but my shortness comes from my damn tibia and femurs in general, right? So I got a long torso, short legs, and short arms. So when I bend forward, my active range of motion is, is not the starting position of a conventional deadlift. It's a little bit higher than that. So that's if I want perfection. And it sounds like you build like me in this case. Maybe three is what you think is best, you can probably reduce it a bit more to be honest with you. So maybe two and a half inches, 
two would be more suitable. And if we're all being honest, okay, like bad leverages or not, we can probably go a little bit deeper than we think. So I would personally recommend pulling off two to five inch blocks and then dropping it down to two, as well as mixing in deficit deadlifts to naturally induce more quad drive. And you see, what I've noticed over the years is that some people can pull more off a deficit. And I think that's one of the reasons. Because you don't get that extra knee bend with the short arms, the deficit gives you ever slightly more. So even though there's more range of motion, the extra quad drive is beneficial. So I would personally gradually start to remove those block heights, like low red, okay? Introduce deficit deads on the, hot, on the side, and then just do RDLs in which you go a little bit deeper every single time. Force it, of course, it's not gonna be coming from hip flexion in the sense that the glutes and hamstrings are no longer really getting additional benefits. It's gonna be your spinal rectors. So it is what it is, but that's probably what you need to strengthen because the thing is, it's not that you can't get in a deeper position. I can take every single one of you, every person on planet Earth, make them do a conventional dead. It might not be optimized biomechanically, but they can do it. You can do it too. You just gotta strengthen the weak links. So that's why I'm telling you, you combine the deficits, less of a block pull, and then you do RDLs with progressive increases, gradually getting deeper and deeper. And I'm gonna advise that as opposed to doing static stretching because in the literature, it doesn't appear to work that well. Mobility comes from strength training. So I hope that helped you out. Dean Fart Goblin, I lust after women, help. You keep asking this question, but if you lust, man, maybe you just need to find a long-term partner and that'll get rid of the problem. Or are you saying that you are in a relationship and you still lust? In that case, man, you're, you, you need to consult somebody else. Opinion on Jailhouse Strong. Yeah, Josh Bryan has some really good advice, man. Like he's, he's coached many elite lifters to pretty much world record status, you could say. Like Julius Maddox is coached by Josh Bryan. And Josh has some, uh, he's really good at relating to people in the sense that he's got the experience, but he's also scientific. And he caters to all kinds of different backgrounds. So it's someone that you feel comfortable listening to. Like, you know that you're not going to give BS advice. Bro, I just came in and just here 2.5 2 5 inches deep. Hey, it's all context, man. A lot of things could be missed, but uh, when you re-listen to this, uh, it'll make sense. <laughs> All right. Is the S or C silent in scent? I think it's silent, but whatever. Okay. David Makayev. What do you think of Wendler's building the monolith? It's a 5-1 program focused on size. Also advice on glute leg insert pain. Worse after a 2G squat. Okay, man. So I'm going to be honest with you, David. I've never heard of this building the monolith program. I, you know... I read the original 531 book. There was also 531 Forever, and then there was a, the, the second one, Building the Monolith. All right, boys, let's, uh, I guess let's have a look at this together. Okay, so this is the program, I believe. It's free. So this is already pre-written. These are percentages, I'm guessing. No, these are weights. Man, this is a lot to go over. Oh, so what am I really looking at here? You do five reps, five reps, five reps, five reps, five reps, five reps. So it's basically a five by five right here, followed by a three by five ramping sets with AMRAPs. Then you do chin ups. So what would 100 reps be? 10 by 10? Or four sets of 25? Or what would realistically allow you to get 100 total reps with this? A band exercise, band pull aparts, 100 total reps. It's actually what I prescribe most of the time. So at the end of a program, you just bang it out real quick, four by 25, something like that. Dips, how, how are you gonna do, how are most novices or like what, is this program for advanced lifters? Because I can do this, okay? That's gonna be a 20 down dip routine, which you've already seen me do on, on this channel, okay? Thing is, I don't think most guys can do that. Um, so this, this strikes me as a system that's not for most people already. 
deadlift, ramping sets of five. I prefer ramping sets as opposed to um, straight sets on heavy deadlifts because of the stimulus to fatigue ratio. However, this is three by five. It's pretty intense, bro. Bench press, again, that's like a five by five, dumbbell row, curl. I, I don't understand this point with the 100 rep stuff. And I'm also seeing very minimal volume for the um, the bodybuilding muscles. So where where's the curls? Where's the long head of the triceps? And then so how come squat is basically... Never mind. I was going to say squats twice a week, but so is the upper. So it's like a hybrid. This is kind of like full body, and that's also full body. So squat, kind of the same shit here. Honestly, dude, I, I, I need more time to look at this. But just first glance... Um, there is some aspects of minimalism here. I can go down further and I'm sure so he waves the percentages So you're using different loads and all that It's probably not bad and Jim's a good coach and everything and this is long so six weeks This advice uh, for diet. I probably wouldn't take it seriously but look To me if you're into bodybuilding, this is not enough and just a hundred total rep thing That's probably not gonna work for a lot of you and then just the heavy fives and all that where's the three sets of ten at like 70%, for example. Where's How come there's only one variation for each on top of that? Why is the volume so low? Why is the frequency so low on certain things? Only three days a week, you know? So those are just some first thoughts, but uh, can't say it would be my first choice, guys. All right. Sec, thank you for the donation. You didn't ask me a question. <laughs> what would you say are your top home gym hacks? Um, I'm going to make a video on my home gym setup. I'm going to show you everything. So just stay tuned for that, you know? Is this a joke? <laughs> no, it's a, it's a serious program. Like, I'm sure it's not bad, man. It's just... See, this guy says, I've been running Born But Big for most of the time and I think it's solid. Yeah, I think boring but big is, is a much better approach than this monolith thing that I just looked at. But again, I, I need to look at it more. It's my first time observing that, you know, and I don't want to spend the whole Q&A on this thing. All right, let's answer some more questions, guys. Yeah, Wendler has more variations. Yeah, exactly. That's not low volume. See, I wasn't, like I said, Marco, I didn't look at the system enough. So if, if what you're saying is the monolith is just the base template and then you add volume on top of it, then I would say that's perfectly fine. So, I'm a, so it's probably the same logic as the boring but big. Okay, I got you. Like I said, bro, I, I don't, I didn't look into it enough. You know, I no, I never ran five three one. I'm not interested in doing that. I'm pro conjugate, bro. And even, and if I wasn't into uh, strength training, I wouldn't even do that at all. It would just be pure dynamic uh, double progression, which I do on my accessory work. Okay. Obvious Lewis Carroll uh, reference. I have a set of bands that are 952 pounds tension and 25 to 81 mini monster. Okay, so that's uh, micro mini and mini band. I'm running naturally enhanced. How should I program these? Okay, dude. So uh, basically, you would use that as a max effort lift. Okay. So it can be for upper body and lower body. You're going to be rotating on a frequent basis, right? I just noticed. Do you guys hear this? Ha! <laughs> this was playing in the background. My bad. That was confusing me. I thought that song was a part of the royalty-free hip-hop mix. <laughs> My bad. Okay, dude. So, use the bands for max effort. Uh, like, benching with bands, overhead press with bands, squat with bands, deadlift with bands by standing on them. And then, if you can do volume, mini... Could be a little bit aggressive if you're doing that on the bench press. It is doable, but I wouldn't abuse the volume on that because the eccentrics are going to be very hard and the lockouts make it kind of difficult. And that's why outside the context of max effort, people who do that, it's typically going to be on dynamic effort day. So pretty much the only thing I would do with those two tensions, and it's what I personally do right now, is you mix it with your free weight as a max effort lift, and that's it. You don't do anything beyond that point. And then if you want to do some reps, micro minis is all you would have to do for a, a squat and a bench, not necessarily deadlift. And then besides mixing it with bars, man, just use them in isolation. So you take your mini band, 
you single it on top of your power rack or whatever stationary and you can do rep work with that so face pulls curls like this uh turning around doing chest flies to work the shortened position a lot of the exercises that um you typically do with cables same thing could be done with bands and that's actually what i did for years before investing in my ghetto setup that i currently use so i had bought all the cable attachments with the carabiners of course and you just clip it onto the band and when you want more tension you double the band so exactly what you do on the straightaway you know when you uh you know you, you double the bands from the bottom you attach it to the barbell sleeves same shit here man so now you can do a lot of pull downs that way you can do a like imagine you got a pair of double minis on each side of the power rack plus your longer bar clipped onto it and you're repping those out it's gonna be pretty tough so i would just use it as a, a progressive overload strategy you know you double them and you add more and then eventually you know you could do the doubled micros so a pair of those plus doubled minis and that would probably be psychotic band tension for most so you know you either use it as a cable replacement and i know that natural hypertrophy does this as well or you use it for max effort but it doesn't have to be a big part of your program beyond that point you know it's going to be a very small amount that is indeed helpful All right. If you had a tiny clone of yourself, would you torture it? Why would I torture? First of all, if I had a clone of myself, it would be sentient. So right off the bat, it's not right. You know, whether you can, whether you argue that cloning is good or bad, what you do after that point, that still matters. Like your morality doesn't go out the window just because it's an experiment, like an experimental clone, you know? And if it is a clone of myself, uh, does that also assume the intellect or is it just like a physical form of me that's like genetically the same but we don't have the same memories per se like it's just an empty brain but you know like a doll type thing so i guess it depends <laughs> how you view cloning in the first place but i wouldn't torture i would try to you know i would, I would run experiments i guess for bodybuilding purposes find out what type of training is, is most effective and then bring it back to you guys how about that all right, my man, Joseph Velasquez. Thoughts on Mike Menser's philosophy of training? So I read all of Mike Menser's books. I seen all the videos on YouTube that promote hit, you know, heavy duty training. And I'm not in agreement of it, though he did strike a good point that failure does matter in the sense that you don't have to reach it absolute, though that's what he argued. But proximity to failure is absolutely key for hypertrophy. So if your reps in reserve are above five and you're not going to make any muscle gains. And that's what a lot of guys do with their high volume fluff and pump systems. It's just endless junk volume. They're not focusing on progression. They're not pushing the intensity. Basically people don't train hard enough in a general sense. <laughs> that's why um, when I made my video recently on learning lessons, one of them is that to learn how to back off. That's because I've always trained hard. I've gone to failure. I've left no more than a rep and reserve. I've, no, I've known how to do that. But if I look at the broad view, people train like you know what. And that's you know something that could be resolved with high intensity training because a lot of it is going to include, well, there's different forms of it like what Dorian Yates uh, recommended. You know, but that's kind of extreme there. So you, you do the super, re you do a lot of rest pause, a lot of drop sets. That's taken, that's extended failure. You go beyond, right? So just that whole aspect is beneficial as well as, you know, you, you can argue the low volume approach in the sense that you don't need excessive amounts of volume to grow like 20 sets a week. But his conclusion was that you just need one set to grow. And that is not supported by any modern evidence, you know? Yeah, and if you guys are going to say, well, those studies are flawed because the people weren't actually going to failure, that's besides the point. We know that two sets is better than one, three sets is better than two. The cutoff point per workout appears to be five sets. So maybe on a workout to workout basis, you don't need to do more than say five sets for your chest, realistically, provide that the intensity is sufficient. But to say that you then need only one set is a bit of a stretch. So when people talk about different extremes, it's either super high volume or super high intensity. The truth usually lies in the middle, like most things in life. And that's how I see it with Mike Menser, you know? Some things he called out correctly, but a lot of it has just been the, debunked in the, in the modern age. 
And um, another thing, though, that people were not a fan of was his emphasis on machines. He said that you want to take out stability if the goal is bodybuilding, right? And many people were really pissed off by that. But you know what? It, it turns out that he, he was probably correct. So it turns out that good hypertrophy exercises create stability. Whereas inferior movements, you have to do the stability yourself. And Fitness FAQs gave a really good example on my channel, right? And he said that you, would, you guys would never forget it. If I told you that squatting on a BOSU ball was the best exercise for growing bigger legs, would you say that makes sense or not? Because technically, it's extremely unstable, right? So if training the stabilizers is what matters for growth, then that would be number one. But it obviously isn't. We can say the same for the bamboo bar bench. Basically, whenever a movement has you coordinating to the absolute max, it's probably not as good for size. And so that's why many like new age trainers, not new age in a spiritual sense, but a lot of newer trainers are recommending like hack squats as opposed to free squats, just because there's more uh, bracing. They're, they're recommending braced curls where you have something behind your body, you know? A lot of stuff like that. And, and Mike was ahead of the game in the sense that he was saying machines aren't bad like some of you guys are claiming. It's not just about the free weights. And that's something that a lot of us are gonna have to come to terms with. You know, now of course some people are gonna take that idea to the extreme again. So the example of the, of the Bosu ball, they're gonna say, okay, that, that means free squats are unstable. And to that I would say, no, like there's a continuum, a continuum of stability and force production. And a normal barbell back squat is probably fine for most people. And I, I've seen some guys, bro, that no cap, they built up to doing four or five for 10 reps on a barbell back squat. They got massive legs in the process. And now they're sitting over here saying, yeah, I don't do back squats anymore. Hack squats are infinitely superior when they just started doing it like six months ago. And sure, that they haven't lost gains and they're continuing to grow. But what got you your results? It was a squat, which is in fact a relatively stable movement. And that's where these machine guys need to shut up because they're, they're claiming that a lot of these basic compounds are extremely unstable when that's a freaking lie and in many times it also contradicts other freeway movements that they'll prescribe over something else like the dumbbell bench press you tell me what's more unstable a dumbbell bench or a barbell bench so we can talk about the humerus you know going across the body that's the function of the pectorals even though the dumbbell press is length and bias to begin with we can we can discuss that but um what's the real wh what are the nuances is where i'm getting at here at the end of the day we're training the stretch <laughs> so i'm just saying guys not everything's black and white and and mike did have a lot of black and white ideologies that are in question today so those are just three things that i touch upon there's obviously more to discuss but if you want more information on heavy duty training like someone who gives really good advice i would say that uh Mr. America Hart is a really good resource to check out. He's a natural bodybuilder. I think he's like 57 years old. He looks fantastic. And that's what um, natural training can do for you, by the way. Health is number one. It's supposed to be a longevity sport, quote unquote. Not break it down, make you feel all snapped up, looking like garbage, all aged. Like, do you, do you see guys? You know, I'm not an old dude by any means. I'm, I'm pretty young, actually. I started my channel at a young age, hence the name Alpha Destiny, which I'm considering renaming there, right? But I'm looking pretty freaking good. Let's keep it real. I don't have any wrinkles on my face. My skin is in good condition. My body's aging better. I'm looking better as I age. The muscle maturity is kicking in. I'm stronger than ever before. I have less pain than I was a freaking teenager, believe it or not, because you get smarter with the programming. Basically, everything in my life has improved on every possible level. Yet I see guys, okay, in this industry, maybe some of these people you freaking watch, they're the same age as me. They look, like we call it in French, magané. Like, their, their face, it, it, it looks like it's made out of freaking leather. And it's not because they, they spend all day in the sun. Um, it's the freaking roids, man. That shit is going to age you. Based off what I've seen, they look like garbage. And in general, you ever see dudes who are in their 30s and 40s who do competitive bodybuilding? Bro, they look 
old, like bad. And I don't know, they get this look. I don't know how to explain it, man, but the longevity is not there. Whereas all the natural bodybuilders or people who focus on natty training, we all look good. And there's a freaking reason for that. So I don't know where I'm going off with this tangent, but yeah, dirt turn, do turn into NH as we say in French. Oui. T'es-tu Québécois comme uh, Moël? Moël? C'est qui ça, Moël? But yeah, I'm from Quebec, bro. Anyway, enough about that. Uh, let's answer uh, some more fitness questions. Unless you got... Yeah, Gears of War face. Yeah, bro. That's exactly the look. Actually, I think... Uh, Derek uh, from More Plates, More Dates. He made a video on that. How to go from uh, a pretty boy to a freaking... Uh, yeah, I think it was Gears of War, right? Or the other, what's that other game that, that came out on the Xbox? I don't even freaking know, man. Magané, that's pure Québécois. Yeah, bro. 100%. Moi, je suis de France. Guadeloupe. Ah, c'est bon, bro. Dr. Mike from RP looks very old, even though he's in the 30s. Yo, I love Dr. Mike, man. I learn a lot from his channel. Uh, he's actually in my top 10 for sure. Great information, which is <laughs> crazy of me to say. As someone promotes natty lifting, but I like his content. But... I swear, like, I thought he was in his 40s, you know? Uh, and he's in his late 30s, I believe. He looked a lot older than that, if you ask me. Come on, guys, this is cause and effect. Let's keep it real. Everyone says, hello, YouTube. Okay, uh, there was a super chat. Harvey Kamek. Hey, Alex, I experimented with snatch grip face pulls, and I highly recommend them. Anyway, do you think Matt Wenning is too dogmatic about squat form? Yes. I love Matt. I did an interview with him and his advice has changed the way I look about fitness forever. He took the conjugate system to the next level. Uh, might even argue superior to Louis Simmons in terms of the applications to raw lifting. So Matt is an incredible resource, an A plus, S plus, S tier bro, in terms of like learning. I cannot recommend this stuff enough. But he always, when he talks about squat form, he justifies it by, well, have you squatted 800 pounds and lived to tell, live to tell the tale like 20 years later or whatever? Because he's injury free, he uses that as a card, you know? But a lot of emerging evidence is suggesting that the body is perfectly suited to go through deeper ranges of motion. You don't have to sit back to that extent, you know? And you can bring your knees way over your toes. Like this is the new meta. So I think just off that, like he's, you know, he has to be a little bit more objective. But the thing is, his squat form won't get you injured. It's not dangerous. It's just you're putting more emphasis on the posterior chain as a whole. You're de-emphasizing the quads ever so slightly. But just look at a lot of Olympic weightlifters that are the same age as him that aren't banged up. As far as I'm concerned, they're also producing amazing squats with minimal knee pain. Now, it might not be 800 pounds or whatever, but still, I, I don't think that you need to have that super wide stance where you're sitting back, you know? I'm just not in agreement on that aspect, and that's perfectly fine. But other than that, he's a good resource, bro. Yo, C-Tang, I missed your super chat. I'm sorry about that. I see it right here. Did your 405 bench have any carryover to your dating life? What is your advice to lifters trying to find a partner? So look, man, I'm in a long-term relationship. Uh, yesterday was actually my three-year anniversary, so it's going real well. And therefore, I met her in 2019. So the 405 bench didn't have any impact on that. The only thing I would say is that I, I bulked really hard to get to that point. And that has implications on your breathing, you know. And that's not good <laughs> if, you, if you catch my drip, you know. And what I noticed, bro, she was telling me that I would snore in the middle of the night, which I've never... I've never done that, you know? So I was getting too fat, bro. I had a bunch of neck fat. Yo, thank you guys. Yeah, I had, pff, fuck man, I was big, you know? So that that's the only thing that I would say. Um, besides that, I, I can't make any comments about dating. You know, what I would tell you is that when I'm in the 160s, I get the most stares. Uh, women are, are nicest to me. They, they look at me differently, you know? I, I suppose being aesthetic is where it's at on that level. But, uh, yeah, like, it's, it's not, get, getting four plates isn't gonna help you in that regard, bro. Um, unless it elevates your confidence to such an extent that 
You're better with women, you know? <laughs> My man, Labib. Nah, bro. But that, that's the only thing I noticed, the, the, the snoring. Uster Losh, thank you for the super chat. You didn't ask me any questions. Uh, Shadwo Corner. Hi, Alex. I'm running Jeffrey's template at the moment. One vertical plus horizontal push per workout three times a week. How and where do you recommend programming dips? You're a great question. And you're always going to go right with Jeffrey's information. So I basically train the same way. I I always match the movement patterns. If I'm doing a pull-up, I'm going to do no HP. If I'm doing a bench, there's going to be a row. I always do an equal amount to both, okay? So the question is, are dips a vertical push or horizontal push? You can argue it's a vertical push, but it doesn't freaking matter because the prime mover is going to be what's going to be your pecs, secondarily delts, and then the triceps aid to assist in the finishing portion. So instead of looking at movement patterns, my man, look at muscle biasing and this can even be extended to the vertical movements so let's say your system called for iliac lat pull down and inverted row you can swap the inverted row for a wide grip like literally out to here pull up because that will emphasize the same musculature rhomboids traps Terry's major. So you see why it's not necessarily the movement pattern, even though like 75% of the time that is the case, it is valid. It's not precise. You understand? So the same logic applies to dips. If you're going to do dips as your first movement, the second motion should be an overhead press. I would, I would not necessarily do bench and then dip right after, unless your focus is just more Peck based but in the generalized context look at the muscles rather than the movement pattern if that makes sense all right you picked the wrong house fool have you ever used l arginine no sir because i've heard it's less bioavailable and you got to use a lot more so i only have experience with citrulline and citrulline malate both of which have absolutely provided better pumps and also beetroot powder. But the thing with beetroot powder is you got to time it about two to two and a half hours beforehand. So that's the only thing. Okay. Karan Katwani. Hey Alex, I have been lifting from last eight months. I have plateaued to 85 kilo bench press. How should I overcome plateau? First of all, congratulations. That's a really good bench to be lifting for eight months. And it sounds to me like you literally did everything right because that's the time frame that I would actually expect for a bench like that. Like you literally, you are a textbook case. So some guys, so check it. <laughs> some individuals take a little bit longer. I, I always give the range of six to 20 months. Six months is for the genetic freaks or people who have past lifting experience. And 20 is like your hard gainer, quote unquote, right? So you're about, you're that eight month, 190 bench, so 85 kilos. You're like the perfect kind of lifter. Like you're someone who's going to be balanced for life. I don't see any problems with that, man. Like you, you did really good. So based off that, I, I would just tell you like you're an intermediate lifter straight up. So maybe you should run something like the conjugate system or 531 or uh, any bodybuilding program for that matter, because you've milked uh, your linear gains. You know, you know, you've been training very basically like you can go beyond this. So there's nothing wrong with you. It's just you've outgrown <laughs> the programming, man. So like I can give you specific tips on overcoming bench plateaus specifically, like doing more pause bench, adding in uh, supplemental work on the side uh, to address your weaknesses, like doing Larson presses like you're eligible to do them now. Uh, flat dumbbell bench like we can go over a host of different movements you know but the main thing is you're running a novice program and that's not going to work no matter how effective the variations are like if i tell you to do a larson press with linear progression you know i'm, I'm telling you i have five pounds of workout that's not going to happen so <laughs> the fundamental problem is programming not necessarily exercise selection even though that will contribute you understand so 
just look up intermediate bench press programs, run any of them, bro. Like literally any intermediate bench program, you're gonna see in a month or two, you're gonna go right through that plateau. Nothing special is required. Trust me on that. Love from Greece, man. Yo, much love, Tassos Marathonitis. Um, yeah, welcome to natural lifting. Damn right, it's freaking slow. But you know what? You do see improvements year after year. Now, I'm gonna make a video on my back and how it actually exploded in size because I was looking at some before, some before pictures, you know? Bro, it, it, it looks like my lats insert at a different point, like, they've a, like they got lower. The thing is, that didn't actually happen. It's just the iliac division of my lats, aka the lower lats, hypertrophied. So I got this freaking look. Never had that in my entire lifting uh, journey of YouTube. So this shit is real. Muscle biasing, you know, hitting different angles. The bodybuilders and the bros, they were onto something, man. And I know you guys can relate on some stuff, you know? All right. You guys are moving quickly with these questions. Uster Locke. Running a novice program right now, twice a week, three by five. I want to cut for summer. Should I ditch squats on deadlift day? Should I ditch anything? Um, you don't have to change anything, dude. I, I wouldn't ditch anything. Like, unless you're having recovery problems, why would you, even if you're cutting, you could you still be able to run the same program, you know? And the thing is, how deep are you into the system? Did you just start off? Are you closing in on the intermediate stage? I think a big misconception is that you have to make drastic cuts to your system. The, the only time I would say that's really valid is in the context of like conjugate. Maybe, maybe you're doing the max effort method every single week. Okay, at that point, you could probably drop doing 100% every single week. But we're talking about basic linear progression, moderate loads. You know, you're not going to extreme failure. It's fairly easy to... To recover, uh, to recover on, given your experience level, I, I really doubt it's going to be a problem. I suppose the only cut I would make, like if you're doing the uh, trap bar deadlifts, the two sets, maybe drop it down to one. So when we talk about reducing, it's going to be in a volume context, and that's pretty much what you've already done because you specified three sets of five as opposed to the five sets. So you're not even running the full system right off the bat. And secondly, you reduce your frequency to twice a week. So just off that, man, the three sets and the two times a week frequency, you're going to be okay. And plus, like worst case, man, instead of ditching a squat, I'd rather you ditch an accessory at the end. So maybe remove the good morning. You know what I'm saying? Or remove, I don't want to say chin up because I freaking love them, but something that's after the main stuff, you know? I think that would be smarter than taking out the actual squad itself. But yeah, not much actually has to be done on this level. NBA Jung Boy. Shout out to, he says, shout out to Sean Ranklin. I don't know who that is, but thank you for the super chat. Naturally enhanced workout complete. Hell yeah. Does your girlfriend lift too? Much love and respect. Absolutely, bro. And I do all of her programming for free, of course. And she has, she has a pretty good genetics as well, especially for the lower body. But we're getting her stronger and stronger. You know, she works very hard, excellent diet. She's good. And, and dedicated, highly motivated. C. Tang, thank you for the super chat. People say Daniel Vadnell isn't natty. I think that's dumb because steroids don't make up for the years of skill work needed for advanced calisthenics. Bro, I'm pretty sure Daniel Vadnell is natty. Like, have you seen his physique? Put it side by side to mine. It's relatively similar. And in fact, put his body next to every natural, like real natural in the history of YouTube fitness. Let's, let's all stand in a room. Let's, okay, me, Omar Isaf, Daniel Vadnell, Scott Herman, uh, Jeffrey Verity, Schofield, Natural Hypertrophy, Bald Omni Man, Alec on Kiri. Let, you know, let, let's just put every natty you guys can possibly think of all in the same room, you know? And you're going to see it's like 80% of our physique is comparable. Like it's not a massive difference like some people believe. It, it's, 
you know, we all end up in a similar spot because that's what natural bodybuilding is. Yeah, Jeff Nippard. Bro, actually, well, you saw me with Jeff Nippard, right? Bro, we have like the same physique. Real talk, like I, I, I did a, um, we did flexing together. It's all on video. And I did a, um, like a little side pose with him. Like see us training side by side. It's the same shit, dude. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I don't see a reason to believe why he'd be enhanced, especially when he's doing those advanced moves. Like, could you, people don't know what it takes to do advanced skill work. I cannot do a planche like he does. And he's fucking six feet or six one. So the leverages are even worse. So working on that for over 10 years, come on, you know? Like what he gets out of calisthenics is better than a short guy like myself. And that goes for every single one of you. Anyone who's six feet plus gang, yo, you're freaking lucky, man, because calisthenics is that much more effective. I wish I can get that effect. Only way I could do is with weighted calisthenics. Or making my leverage is so garbage that I have no choice but to grow from that, you know? But uh, to me, I, I don't question him on that level, you know? And I suppose the only thing that people have against him, it would be the fact that he's from Australia and steroids are more accessible in that area. But just because you have uh, some people doing that doesn't mean everyone is, you know? Like look at Ivan Jurek, same location, not on roids and strong. <laughs> You know, deadlifting 585, that's good money right there. So to me, there, there's no question that he's natty. All right, Chico. 5'6", 205, 34 years old. Never listed serious or long-term. Way back in the day, newbie gains to consistent lifting or calisthenics for how long with this type one love? How long, you ask? As long as everybody else. In fact, it doesn't matter that you're 34 years old. You never lifted seriously, no long-term stuff, never got your newbie gains for the most part. Like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you, you could have been 40 years old or 50 years old. Anybody who was still a novice, you got linear gains to make. Run my novice program, run any novice program on the internet, and you will clearly see with proper nutrition that every week you're going to be adding weight to the bar. I can pretty much guarantee it. So if your barbell back squat is 135, you know, week two, it might be 145 at a bare minimum. You, every workout, you're going to be able to add five pounds or at least add like one to two reps. It, it's going to be very consistent progress, very few plateaus. And another thing that you might not be aware of, you're 5'6 at 205, okay? I'm basically that, five foot five and a half. My heaviest weight where I start to look like like real big is 189, okay? 189, 190. And this is me being an elite lifter, quote unquote, benching four plates. That means that you, being a novice at 205, your shredded weight, like what I got recently, would be like 130. So you got like 70 pounds of fat on you realistically, which might sound insane, but I'm telling you that's the truth. So just off that, you can recomp very effectively. You got extra reserves, my man. I'm telling you that's a fact. It's going to be a lot easier. You don't even have to bulk. You're already bulked. So newbie gains are still there. And because there's years of reserves, you know, you, you gain weight slowly over time, it's going to be an effortless process. So like I said, man, run any program, newbie gains are going to be boom, 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 super fast. I freaking guarantee it. And you keep me updated because I'm excited to hear about your progress, all right? So many people here flexing instead of asking serious, useful questions. Nah, man, I think we got a pretty good Q&A. But, uh, you know, that's subject to uh, your opinion. Okay. Can a natural reach a 225, 100 kilo HP with just linear progression, simple progression? Looking forward to the concurrent Cali program. Yeah. So... First of all, you ask, can a natural do it? Yes, because it, there's a can in there, okay? And, and a lot of people can do many things that are freakish. That doesn't mean it's the best way, right? So, and also, what do you define as simple progression? Because linear progression, like, would you count dynamic double progression as linear progression? It's, it's technically an advanced form of it, but it's still simple at the same time. But... It's not periodized, you know? So on a system like that, you can absolutely hit 225. 
And in fact, I would say that most bodybuilders, like let's look at natural bodybuilders, right? Who've been training for 10, 20 years. They're not weak guys. Usually they're they're strong. They can rep out 185 on the OHB, typically seated there, but they're around that mark. And I would say that 90% of them did not periodize. You know, a lot of them have benched somewhere in the 300s. I saw a guy the other day claim uh, 385 touch and go. You know, like these are good numbers. And although if they ran powerlifting programs, their potential would be even higher because it is there. Like you can still get really freaking good performance. And I think this obsession with periodization is starting to become a little bit overrated as we get more information, you know, as the, the meta is expanding, we learn that everything works for the most part. And you know, a lot of old timers had it right that consistency is number one. So look, a hundred kilos, that's a freaking hard number to hit. I did it, it took years and I was also a lighter body weight, right? I had to periodize for that. I don't think it would have been so straightforward with uh, linear progression. But it's also my worst lift, you know? I don't have the best genetics for overhead press, uh, leverage-wise, right? If you were to ask me, what about a three-plate bench? Then I would say that, yeah, for sure, I can do it with, uh, you know, double progression or whatever. You know, and in general, a lot of these progression models that are linear-based or anything that's, like, super simple, you're going to do that on your accessories anyway. So, you know, let, let's say you get really good carryover from uh, an incline dumbbell bench, right? You're doing 85 pounds, you work up to doing 100 pounds. Did you periodize your dumbbell pressing? Like, really, did you? Probably not. It was just basic linear progression, but you got slowly stronger over time. And then that process gave you a carryover to the barbell bench press. And so, I wouldn't even call this a black and white question because we can mix in elements of both. So just off that, like my answer, like first you ask can, so the answer is already going to be yes. <laughs> and then there's the context of the overall program, which features elements of simple progression to begin with. So that's a double yes, even though it's not absolute. So I hope I'm not <laughs> overcomplicating things too much here, but yeah, you can go really far without breaking your damn mind, you know? Thanks for the in-depth reply, Alex. Cheers. I'm happy that was helpful, dude. And thank you for the super chat. All right. Yo, we got so many questions. Holy crap. But I'm here for you guys. We're going to do it, okay? My man, Moped. Hey, Alex, I'm 16, weighing in at 130. My bench is currently 185 after six months of training. Should I be running an intermediate program? Also, what stage of lifting would the pecs start to shine? I like how you phrase that. The, the pecs are going to shine. So look, dude, you have uh, amazing genetics. 16 years old, 185 bench, only 130 pounds. That is a freakish body weight ratio right there. And you did after, bro, six months of lifting at that age. The, you, you, to me, like that, that, that's, in, that's indicative of a person that's gonna bench well over 350 as an adult. Like that would be the minimum. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if you could eventually bench four plates, you know, that, that is, you know, provided that this rate of progression continues and you, you know, don't get snapped up, you monitor everything correctly, your, like, your potential is going to be higher to begin with. So let's start off with that, okay? You ask, what stage of lifting would the pecs start to shine? I would say when you start gaining more weight. Because you sound to me like you're one of those pound for pound guys. And weighing 130 is not going to leave you having massive pecs, like unless you're really short. That would be the only exception. So I referenced my shredded transformation before. So I went from like high 180s to 146, 150. Okay. That's at, that's being a shorter guy. If you're the same height as me, you know, may, maybe you can be shredded at 150 but that means you still got to put on 20 more pounds of muscle is what I'm saying. But you know, you probably have more puberty gains to make as well. So look, I, I would need to know your height to be honest with you, right? That that's a really big component and your estimated body fat percentage. But if you're similar to me, you need at least 20 more pounds. 
So let's just start with that, right? Uh, that's if you want to look like really freaking jacked. Otherwise, maybe 10 pounds of muscle is all you're going to need more. You know, if, if you're single digit at 130, get to 140 at single digit, your bench is going to be somewhere in the mid 200s. And by that point, you would have been lifting for like two years or whatever. You should have some watermelon pecs if you ask me. But uh, besides that, it's hard to say like what exact stage because we're all very individual and because of leverages, it, it could affect the process a bit. You know, like the pecs, you know, if you have really short arms and it's like above parallel, you know, maybe for you to have the same pec development as someone with a, a normal arm length, you're going to have to bench over 50 pounds more. It's, it all depends on the individual, bro. So, at the end of the day, man, like, you know you got good genetics. So, all I'm going to tell you is it's a matter of time. As long as you stay committed to the process, everything's going to be fine. Like, straight up, this is not even a concern. But uh, thank you for your support, bro. And I know you got this. Hmm. Been going for an hour, guys. And we're, we're, we're really moving at a good pace here. Okay. My man, Dave. Six foot one, 200 with a four or five squat, 500 dead, but only a 275 all time bench after five plus years of lifting. Six foot three wingspan, uh huh. And struggle in the mid range. Any tips for long arm guy? Your normal ratio, uh, your ratio is normal, dude. Like, this is very common in the powerlifting world. Actually, uh, like, on average, it would be four or five squat, 500 dead, and 315 bench. That's like just textbook. But the thing is, you're 6'1", so already tallness is going to be a factor on the bench. And on top of that, your wingspan exceeds your height. So, of course, that's why you struggle. It's, it's entirely due to your leverages, man. And based off that, there's, there isn't even a problem here. Like, honestly, dude, there's not even a problem. You say you struggle in the mid-range, but really, you just struggle, period. Because you're disadvantaged, right? So, for you... You probably are an advanced adventure just off your leverages. And uh, a really good guy I can recommend you check out is uh, Brandon Campbell Diamond. He's been in the YouTube game for over 10 years. And just like yourself, he struggles with the bench. I, I think he's six foot four, but his wingspan is above that. And his all time bench, it might be like 340, 350, something like that. So he had to get really good at dialing in his programming, you know? And uh, for you, man, a lot of focus on pause reps, technique work, and just getting stronger out, the, out of the bottom is what's going to help because for you, whenever you bench, you're going through a very large range of motion, right? So just off that, your triceps are getting sufficiently stimulated. And this is what I've noticed in people who are torso versus arm dominant. Shorter guys don't really grow as much in the triceps from bench because everything, like it's a short stroke, you know what I'm saying? Whereas taller guys, like you get that maximum stretch at the bottom, so your pecs get thoroughly developed, but then you got to go through a full extension of the arm. You're so freaking bent at the bottom that, you know, you, you're, you're going to develop more, basically. More range of motion, better, right? So, I wouldn't necessarily say that you need more, like I, I'm talking about triceps right now, but I wouldn't say you need more like extensions and board presses and stuff like that. The main issue is that you're weaker in that length and position, Similar to someone who does deficit bench presses. That's you automatically. So you have to train movements that exaggerate that position. Such that your normal range of motion bench becomes a board press. Like, does that make sense? Basically, let, let, me, let me bring it back to myself. Uh, I recently did 280 or 285 for three sets of 10 on the flat bench. What did you see me hit two weeks ago on the Larson press with a 100% flat back? 255. Similar intensity, about a 30 pound drop. That's basically me equivalent to you on a generalized basis. I've also done with an arch, 275 on the Larson press for three sets of eight. So. The flatter your back becomes, the more range of motion you get because the arm comes further past the torso. But 
when you already have long arms, when you're this type of individual, four play squat, five play dead, two and a half bench, that's already you. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so you just got to get stronger in that messed up position, man, straight up. That is what's going to fix it. <laughs> and the best way is probably going to be doing a lot of Lars, uh, Larson presses. Everybody who does these will tell you that the mid range gets stronger. I can also say weighted dips. You're going to have super range of motion in the pecs. Weighted push-ups as well. But basically, just do more presses as a whole where you're performing full range of motion. I would much rather you do that over like a floor press or a board press. Make sense, homie? All right. Uh, C. Tang. NH recently said that strength standards are rather arbitrary and pointless. He's probably talking from a bodybuilding perspective. Thoughts? So I saw that video. Uh, some points he raised are good. Others, not so much. Problem is, dude, it's a very long video. And if you want me to address all that, it's going to be real talk about a two-hour video. Because, like, just look at my response to Greg Doucette, right? He made what was it, a 15 minute video about me? And my response was 45 minutes because you have to take the snippets and then you have to respond to each individual segment. And because NH's videos are extremely long, just off that, you know what? It wouldn't be two hours. It'd be a three hour video easy, like guaranteed. And why, why should I even, you know, for me, my channel isn't pure bodybuilding. It's a combination of general strength and size. I do it all. I like calisthenics. I like maximum strength. I like bodybuilding. I like cardio. I'm all I'm the jack of all trades, master of none, you could say, you know? The only thing that's elite about me is my bench press and way to pull up. Like realistically. Or, or you can say my o, you can say my OHP is elite as well. Like on a body weight level, you know, I I would I'll do pretty good in uh what's that sport called where it's not um squat bench dead, strength lifting. There you go. I think it's pretty respectable, but just to say, my stuff is not just about bodybuilding, and I find that strength standards are helpful in just setting a standard. Like, <laughs> sure, there are like <sighs> the, the the thing is everything. Like, what's the like? What's the point of me even talking about this? There's no agreement. I'm not going to debate the guy, and we have different viewpoints about physique training to begin with. You know, I think if I say train for, train for a three play bench and a lot of people want to hit that, what's the problem? Like it's arbitrary. Yeah, it's 345s per side, but who cares? People want it. Man, I haven't addressed anything he said and I don't think I want to. And you know what, dude, I would just appreciate not asking questions about long form content like that because there's nothing i can't respond to all that it's impossible it's going to be three hours literally three hours i have to go through every point individually and i don't want to straw man on, on on everything but one thing that he did point out like he said if you rush progression problem is you can't do that when you're really strong so he said if you try to get to a two plate overhead press in one year as opposed to three then you would be proportionally smaller than a guy who just did it with hypertrophy training the issue is when we talk about these elite standards, there are no shortcuts and hypertrophy is the gateway by which you will get stronger. So show me a guy who can get to that amount in a year and I can promise you he's a genetic freak for strength. And 99% of every motherfucker on planet earth would have massive shoulders getting that number in a normal time frame. And it took me years and years and years to do it. So it's like some stuff cannot be rushed after a certain point. And I think he would understand that more if he, hit, if he hit some of these numbers, like for me to get a four plate bench, okay, I had to get bigger. Like, sure, I was maxing out on a frequent basis. The max effort method was twice a week. But looking at my training objectively, it was really the volume back downs that helped the most. Like real talk, that's what's going to build the majority of your strength after a certain level. And it just so happens that in competitive powerlifters, when you look at their competitive... Um, placings, right? How good they're going to be. You can literally 
plotted down on a chart, linear correlation. It's extremely high, by the way, according to muscle mass. Basically, you can have these powerlifters do DEXA scans before the competition, and you can predict with like 95% accuracy which guy's gonna win. So that indicates uh, something real, you know, regarding strength standards. But again, these are talking about like elite lifters, not the standards that he was discussing, right? So that's why I don't even want to talk about this, even though I'm doing it right now, because everything I say is going to be a straw man, because I need to go through his points individually instead of just rambling about nonsense. But just to say, I think a lot of people aren't training 100% for bodybuilding. They have varied goals, you know? And for those people, having something to shoot for that a lot of other people have done, I think makes sense, you know? And so what if it's 100% arbitrary? I'm going to put on these glasses for a bit, guys. What do you think? Yo, my man, Croissant. What's up, dude? You got to get more out of less weight. Oh, fuck. I lost the question. God damn it. There were two of you guys. Oh. Yo, there was two of you guys. I lost it. My bad. I'm really sorry. Please repost it, okay? I'm going to get to you. Elie Demille. Hi, bro. I'm one of your followers from France since 2016. I'm still doing full body. Will you do a collab soon as you did with Jeff or Omar before? I actually do have a collab coming soon which I'm not going to disclose because let's keep things uh, private for now. You're going to find out after the fact, but absolutely, man. I want to start doing things with other YouTubers. You know, I didn't do that because of the uh, global events from 2020 till now, but things are getting back to normal and uh, I'm excited for what the future holds. And, uh, you know, maybe even I can go to the Toronto, a Toronto pro show this year, potentially that would be cool for sure. But uh, much love, man. 2016, that's the official OG year. You know, that was, that's, that's, a. Uh, feels like it was yesterday, honestly, but it was so long ago. That's freaking six years ago. Absolute insanity, you know? So, uh, thank you for sticking around for all this time. And I'm happy that full body has benefited you for years and years. You can absolutely get a lead with that. I did it. Karim El, El Tawansi. Hey Alex, thanks for all the content. What specialty bar do you recommend for bodybuilding purposes? I can only afford to store one in the gym I train. Ooh. Well, that's going to depend if your goals are more upper body or lower body based. If you're an upper body specialist, then my first choice would hands down be the Swiss bar. And I might recommend in your case, the angled Swiss bar, just because you can flip it around. So you can not only press with your arms like this, so kind of like a uh, reverse grip bench, but you can do it like that as well. So it's not fully neutral or pronated. So just the, the flipping action itself, it's going to give you a lot of options. It might actually be better for overhead press. So the Swiss bar with that, you can do Swiss bar incline, standing overhead press, Swiss bar floor press, Swiss bar flat bench. You can use it for curls. It's basically an all encompassing bar. It even replaces hammer curls. So some douchebag is using all the, the dumbbells, you know, for triple drop sets or whatever, and you're just there sitting, go grab uh, the Swiss bar and do some hammer curls like that, you know? Extensions, really easy on the elbows. You can even put the thing on top of the pull-up bar and do various pull-ups. So let's say your gym only has a straight bar and you're forced to do chin-ups or overhand with the Swiss, you can do more. So that, that for upper body, that would be the primary choice. Now for lower, the, the, the two options would either be a trap bar deadlift or a safety squat bar. I would personally recommend the safety squat bar. And the reason being is you can build your legs with good mornings and RDLs. And then if you want to throw in dead stop work, like all the deadlifts and even block pulls will give you similar benefits to the trap bar deadlift to begin with. And in a commercial gym, you can use those heavy dumbbells as kind of like a replacement. So go grab like the 150s and assume a neutral grip. Do deads with that, you know? So for lower body, SSB. And keep in mind, you can flip it two different directions, right? Camber facing normal direction and upside down. 
And you could do good mornings with that thing too. So in a way, that gives you a better exercise than a trap bar deadlift. Alex, I'm 5'8", 195, early intermediate lifter with a decent amount of muscle mass. Want to get down to 160 lean by July, but don't want to lose muscle. By July. So that's three months. That's, that's, um, you're going to lose muscle. You will. I'm just telling you how it is, bro. You're an early intermediate. That might put you back at late novice. And uh, 195 to 160 in three months is very short, dude. That's really short. Like, if you were 180, 185, I would say it's more doable. But just because you got that extra 10 pounds on, man, like, I, w I would personally, like, if you do it by mid-August, you're going to be in a better spot. So I would suggest taking a little bit more time with your cut if you want to minimize the muscle loss as much as possible. That is the number one approach. Otherwise, you can go fast like for the first month just to get a big jump right off the bat and then slow cut for the next two months. That would probably make more sense instead of just being aggressive all the way through because uh, the first month you tend to retain more muscle mass, you know? Alternatively, you can mix in fasting like 72 hour fasts once a week or 48 hour fasts once a week. Those tend to be muscle sparing. And for, for those who say, well, how can that be true? It must be a lie. You've obviously never done it. Like it, it shows, it shows that you're a liar, that you're talking out of your ass. Don't you dare say you've done a 48 hour fast and claim that you lost a bunch of muscle by the end of it. That is a fucking lie. Maybe the mat, maybe you were depleted because, you know, you lost all your water weight and you're, you had no muscle glycogen left. But the moment you started eating again, a week later, not even, you're hitting the same numbers in the gym. So if we know that to be true, why not hit a 48 hour fast every week to speed up the cut? Also, I recommend you check out the aggressive fat loss manual by Lau McDonald. I think it came out like 15 years ago, but still valid to this day, man. It's basically a period where you eat a very small amount of calories, like 1200 or something, but you jack up the protein like three times the amount. And you just do that in little phases and it tends to speed up the process ever so slightly without breaking down your muscle at the same rate, just compared to normal crash dieting. So definitely read that manual as well. So I think with those tips, you should get your 160 lean, no issues. Okay, my man, NBA Jung Boy, best beard to make your face and jawline look better. So a shorter beard is going to be the way to go. And you're going to want to use a straight razor on your neck, you know? So this is what I've been doing recently. I think it looks pretty good, you know? So you see how it contours, you know, you, you do a, you do a square formation and you straight razor the top too, right? You don't, you don't want a bunch of hairs creeping up to your eyes and the neck, you don't want to have a freaking neck beard down to there. Okay. You gotta, and also you don't want to bring the hairs. Like if I do this, I don't shave this part off. Like where all the, the fat is, you want to go right underneath, go around that kind of shape. You know, you want it to contour about a finger away from the actual bone. So right, so if you look at me, man, it's just, it's right there. One finger, shave. And then in terms of growth, you don't want it to be like, uh, like I said, not having a neck beard helps a lot, but the next step is the density of the beard itself, right? Three millimeters, is probably where I would leave it at, like at the bare minimum. But anywhere between three and nine millimeters is the optimal density. When you start going beyond that point, you're gonna get this, it's gonna start to look too puffy, you know? So that's for the sides of the beard as it contours your jawline. And then the center itself where the chin is, you're gonna wanna leave this um, 
minimum nine millimeters. Don't go below that point because then it makes you look, uh, makes your face a little bit shorter, but you wider on the side. So nine to 16 millimeters is the range here, but nine to 12 is the best that I found. So on the side, anywhere between three and nine and in the middle, nine to 16, okay? And then the mustache, you wanna leave it about four and a half millimeters to seven millimeters. And then if you want, you can add a little bit of a fade as well based off whatever density you have. But that would be the best way of getting a, a lean beard. <laughs> okay. Because it never answers me, so I will go. Yo, you left at the wrong time because I was right about to answer you, bro. So let me... Uh, Where's your question, dude? I'm, I'm doing control F. I don't see a single question. <laughs> What's your question? I'm, I still can't find it. Control F, control F, control F. I don't see a single question, dude. I'm sorry that you showed up here three times and didn't see it, but you gotta understand we got hundreds of people in here and this thing moves very fast, you know? So there's not only all you guys in the chats, it's going like this. But I get these super chats as well. And the problem with freaking YouTube is that you lose the ability to scroll up, you know? So it's unfortunate, but I can't just save the super chats and answer them at the end, you know, unless I physically write them down. So I'm just going to continue with these super chats, all right? Uh, Frankie Kusuna or Kuskuna. Your consistency is inspiring. I'm 190, 23% body fat, five, eight and a half, one and a half years training experience. Struggle with diet, what's a consistent diet plan that's enjoyable, no calorie tracking. Well, the thing is, dude, usually you want to start off with calorie tracking just so that you understand the calorie manipulation process. This is how most of us tend to get away with intuitive type eating. And if I'm being honest with you, that's exactly what I'm doing right now. I haven't counted macros since late December, realistically. Because when you weigh your food every single day, bro, like everything, even your freaking, I'm not going to say your spices, but in, instead of taking tablespoons, and let's say you're measuring uh, like best sell, you know, instead of like visually eyeballing it, you literally weigh out the grams of the tiniest stuff, you know, once you've done that for months at a time, like literally, bro, you can go anywhere, look at a plate and say, ah, that's about 450 calories or 800 calories. And the reason is that you have all this reference experience in your brain. Like it's so second nature, you know, you, you, you can literally, like it's nighttime, right? You're chilling, you're just relaxing and you're thinking back, oh, what I eat today? I had this, that, this, that, you know, use some basic mental math. Oh, I had about 2,700 calories. Now, you might point out, well, a lot of people are bad at estimating macros, right? That's only correct among normies, as NH likes to call them. If you actually did a real diet, bodybuilder style, bro, you would be able to estimate with about 90% accuracy. And that's not an exaggeration. A lot of us, like Jeffrey Verity Schofield and myself, are doing that perfectly. So... I would tell you to track your macros for about three months. That's it. A short duration like that. And you should understand <laughs> what you need at that point, as well as knowing which foods tend to leave you a little bit deficient. So when I was on a 100% vegan diet, I noted that vitamin E was a bit difficult for me to get because I wasn't consuming any oil. I was doing primarily SOS free. So vitamin E was a big one, and there was one more uh, mineral that I struggled to get. I can't remember which one it was, but it was those two things that every day I'd be like, and I remember I added pumpkin seeds to try to fix the situation. I was like, I need to do something about this. There was one of those minerals, bro. I had a very hard time getting it, and I was eating a variety of different foods. But uh, you wouldn't know that unless you, you actually track. So that's why I'm telling you, track first, and then you can run whatever diet you want, based off what foods you found to be enjoyable. Because when you diet, man, 
you, you learn like, fuck, I don't enjoy this, man. I don't ha I don't enjoy having egg whites and oats and all this stuff. I just want to have things that I can eat for pretty much the next decade or so and not struggle whatsoever. So you're going to learn that with something that's really strict, something that's restrictive. T basically, restrictiveness teaches you not to restrict. It's paradoxical, but it makes sense when you actually get into the trenches, my man. So that's some basic advice. Start tracking and then you won't have to. It's reverse. <laughs> it's a reverse answer is what I gave you. But uh, in terms of what I believe is an enjoyable and consistent diet, uh, I follow the evidence, bro. So whole food plant-based, a big emphasis on beans, whole grains, Italian cuisine, baby, please. That's what I like, you know, but I don't know what culture. Well, you, <laughs> Frankie, you're probably Italian. Same thing, eh? You can eat Italian food year round. L look into the Blue Zone Solution. Look at the Sardinians, what they eat. That kind of food is probably up your alley. So there you go. But for now, you want to track, all right? I'm tired of oats, brother. <laughs> Yo, some people, they get, yeah. Zinc or iron. Uh, it might have been zinc. I think it, it might have been zinc. It was the exact same as me. Yeah. Yeah, it was, eh? Pretty sure it was zinc. It was zinc and vitamin E. <laughs> Those two freaking, oh, it was annoying. But you know what? Um, I did really good on that diet. You know, I documented a lot of performance. My first 350 close grip bench, I was vegan. When I did a 225 dip, also vegan. A wide grip, neutral pull up, 165 pounds, vegan. Uh, I didn't have any trouble getting muscle. It was just like you had to really dial in your, your diet. You couldn't just do whatever on a daily basis. You know, you, you had to freaking pay attention. As long as you did it correctly, man, it was fine. Uh, Nashville arm wrestling can you use banded bench to develop massive triceps. I'm not worried about chest size. So we kind of had a similar question before about uh, micro mini bands and mini bands. And what I said was that I only use them for two purposes being max effort and maybe volume work with micro minis. Uh, and, and occasionally the minis, but it's hard on your recovery, so I don't really recommend it. So in your case, first of all, are you talking about band only bench press or bands plus the barbell? Because you said banded bench, right? So when you say banded bench, does that mean you're lying down on the floor? Sorry, you're lying down on the bench and you got two bands wrapped around it, like physically, like coming from here. And you're just pressing away like that or do you mean on the sleeves normally or are you talking about uh the dumbbell version so you're doing the dumbbell bench and you got a band behind you because that's actually a good variation if it's any of those uh those are not going to be tricep biased even though the strength curve is is more uh in the end range it's pretty much going to emphasize the shortened position of your, of your pec muscles. You're in a converging type of motion. And when you get to the top, you're going to be squeezing very hard. So I, w I would not recommend that at all for building massive arms. Like I think that's a terrible idea. It's not going to work if it's the band only version. Now, if it's the banded bench press as in using accommodating resistance, then that's a great idea. So if you do a close grip bench press with doubled micro mini bands, that's going to be a hell of a tricep builder. You're, you're going to feel it a lot in that region because you basically inverted the strength curve somewhat. The thing is your chest is still going to get bigger, but it's going to bias the lateral, the lateral head of the triceps a little bit more. And basically, if you train like an equipped power lifter, someone who wears bench shirts, you use all those variations, that becomes your specificity. The bodybuilding side effect is de-emphasizing shoulders and pecs just a bit. So... Bands for that way are fine, but in isolation, it's going to be more uh, pectoral biased in the shortened position because you're bringing the humerus across the body under load. The resistance of the band is coming that way. <clears throat> What's up, Natty boys? What's up, dude? 
Yo, my man, see Tang. You're a tank today. I appreciate you. Do you think your strength will grow if you train with Kiriakos Grizzly? Dude, I think everybody would grow if they train with Kiriakos. You have to live it. And he's definitely living it. He's definitely living it in Greece. And I think a Canadian came over there recently. You better be careful because that dude's going to become a bloat lord very soon. But, um, no, I like the guy, man. I've been following him way back since uh, Louis Marco talked about him. He just doesn't carry. This is what he's got to do, you know? I think that we can learn a lot <laughs> from his mindset. Not necessarily the training style, but the ability to just grind. Like, if you look at his oldest videos, bro... Look at that, man. So he benches 200 kilos for reps. Now look at that range of motion when he does it. And not really the greatest, but uh, when you bloat it up, man, you're capable of doing a lot of things. And a lot of people have discovered that bloat maxing is the secret to becoming strong. Like real talk, man. You do this naturally, you know, you get real big, you're going to find out that uh, you were always capable of more. That, that's basically how you surpass the natty limit. You know? You, you gotta freaking get mad fat. Like if I, if I weighed as much as him, I'd be benching 200 kilos as well, if you ask me. Like if I, if I did it at 185, imagine, like imagine if you're, you know, you're benching the same weight that you weigh. Isn't that realistic? Like real talk guys, like if you're doing, if you're 200 pounds, benching 250 how much would you bench press at 250 you know like and especially the bench press it's one of those lifts where weight is correlated with size and everybody who gets stronger they will, will tell you the same thing bloat saga when well my bloat saga was kind of uh when uh, i did the bear mode thing years back like hardcore the heaviest i got at the time was 191 in a bloated state and also, uh, last year when I got the 405 bench, I definitely blow max on that, you know? I was real big. Like, I was, I was, man, I didn't like being in that state, you know? Too much for my taste. After being ascetic and seeing what that's all about, it's too much. At the buffet, there you go. Yeah, I, I've, I've done my bloating. A lot of us have, man. All the serious naturals, we've been through that phase. But I, I wouldn't do it again just because my health is number one. And I want to live to 100 years old if possible. Actually, I saw um, a poll before by Greg Doucette. He was talking about, it actually blew my mind. Would you take a million dollars and look like Chris Bumstead, but die at 60 years old, or be 100 healthy and poor? And I think 70% of his, of his audience chose the Chris Bumstead option, which blew my freaking mind. Because 60 years old, uh, over 100, that's 40 years of life. You trade 40 years of life for money and to have a drugged up physique? Man, fuck that shit. I'll take health every single day. It just goes to show that the bodybuilding world has different priorities as people who are about real fitness. But if you read the comment section, you're going to see some smart minds who are like, yo, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> are you Greek broski? Yeah, it depends how poor you are. Exactly. That makes a difference. That makes a massive difference because what's poor in 2022? Uh, it's a pretty good standard of living, you know Poor is 74% now, that's crazy Alex, that's some real talk right there Yo, real recognize I, I honestly find it insane Like I'm legitimately, like my mind exploded when I saw that If, wow When you're young, you don't realize how fast time goes by True And this is the same justification that people use to take steroids Because they're going to die anyway, right? You only, you only live once. Man, I don't mess with that philosophy. Okay. Well, I, I agree in the sense that you have to make the best out of this life, you know? Don't just be a human slug. Be the best version of you. Always strive for self-improvement. Set higher goals for yourself. It's important to be a complete badass in all walks of life. And know that you got everything that this world had to offer. The things that didn't bring you misery though in the sense that like it's not degenerate you know it uplift things that uplift the soul just make you happier in the long term 
That's what I mean by getting the most out of this world. And that's what has to be focused on. And steroids, dying at 60 years old, but you got this money, what for? You know? There's more things in life that are important. And imagine the body this more for you would get being in that condition as well. Having to maintain such a physique at 60. That's crazy. All right. Nourishing, productive, interest, motivations. Of course. What's your max reps on dips? I think I did 67 reps. I should do an AMRAP again soon. Um, I had a question before. Man, these are so fast. I'm sorry, guys, if I'm not getting to all of them. I just saw one. I, I freaking missed it. You missed Artie. Yo. I'm going to have to... I'm going to get to all these. Um, Artie, repost your question because it, it got lost. Uh, my apologies. I'm going to read this one, though. Jonas Leto. My knees got effed in the army 10 years ago. And even walking stairs hurts them. Cycling is okay. Got it. Any easy on knees lifts that I could try to strengthen my knees. Yeah, I've heard that, you know, guys who get hurt in the army or they're in constant pain moving forward because they've been told that they're superhumans and they end up getting broken, right? I'm sorry you had to go through that. My friend's in the military right now and I believe he also has, actually, it's not I believe, I know. He went to go see a doctor and they examined his knees, Okay. And they said he had the knees of a 45-year-old man. Yep. And uh, that's crazy because he trains hard and you would never expect that. But his joints are effed. So I believe you when you say that, bro. Because my, my homie, man, I'm close with him. He's pouring the same thing. And we're the same freaking age. So look, you said cycling is okay. Cycling is good for getting blood flow in the knees. And in general, isolating the quads is probably helpful in this regard. If you're able to cycle, you can probably do leg extensions to some capacity, right? But um, you're going to have to start with very small regressions. Like I had a question before that was very similar on uh, knee pain and building up the quads, slowly working your way in. So when you replay this um, live stream, you can check that out. But my number one recommendation, man, is to check out the knees over toes guy because he gives you all the regressions that you need to the point where it works for 65 year old women with banged up joints you know ben patrick his mother got started not too long ago you know now she's able to run jump do all these things that the younger girls could do too and a lot of people who came from the powerlifting scene are now introducing his ideologies mark bell yo he's been making all kinds of videos with knees over toes guy because the information is legit. Joe Rogan featured him too. You know, this is not some hocus pocus uh, nonsense. Like, real talk, bro. You check out that channel. You're going to get all the tools you need. And most of it is just going to be working in those bad positions that hurt you. You know, you say walking stairs hurts them. Why? Because the forces that's involved in bending your knee ever so slightly, they're weak. Your ligaments, man. The, the ability... Knee flexion is compromised right now due to weakness. So it's not that you have to avoid training that position. It's that you have to strengthen it with very easy movements. Like literally, like for example, guys who have messed up pec tendons, you know what they got to do? Push-ups on the walls. Push-ups on their knees. You know, you have to do very, you got to train as if you're an older woman. How about I phrase it like that? You got to baby them while working in the positions that hurt you. You know? And maybe for now, that's going to be taking a band and doing terminal knee extensions. So you're getting this much range of motion on the knees. But that's probably what you need right now. So definitely check out Knees Over Toes Guy and don't avoid training those positions is what I would tell you. Backwards, sled pulls. That's going to be helpful. Uh, doing reverse band squats. Like we do that with 12 year olds, man. When you're trying to get them into strength training, you, you get them used to hand your, handling heavier loads in the short position. And you may, and you, you deload it at the bottom. Like that's the type of stuff you got to do, bro. 
Dude, you missed my super chat again. I'm, yo, I'm, I'm trying, man. I'm doing my best over here. If I, if I banged out these questions extremely quickly, blitz style, I'd be able to go through all of them. But just stay here. I'm going to get to it. Okay, I got you. Two times a week, three by five guy, 147 pounds, five foot eight, 18 percent body fat, squat 200, conventional dead 255, bench 163, OHP 123. I want to draw 12 percent, recomp better maybe. I don't think that's a good idea. I think you should be bulking, man. Like you, you should slowly bulk to 20 percent body fat, which. If you do it correctly, you take your sweet time, my man. You might be in the high 150s. And your squat is going to be in the high 200s. Conventional dead in the 300s. Bench, you're going to be like right at 200. OHP guaranteed 135. Whereas if you drop to 12%, uh, you, might, you might even get weaker or uh, barely make any progress at all. And the thing is, at 147... Like that's very small at five foot eight for eighteen percent body fat. So what do you, dude? At twelve percent body fat, do you know how much you're gonna weigh? You're gonna, you're gonna be at least, you're gonna be minimum one thirty five, but realistically probably one thirty. So if you want to look big and have some impressive numbers, that's not the right approach, if you ask me. Like you need to bulk. Like real talk, bro. You need you need to gain some weight. I would maybe bulk to 160 and then do a cut to 12%. I, I don't think a recomp is, is the answer right now. But what do you guys think? Do you agree or disagree? These spammers, man. <laughs> okay. You're missing all the super chats. You know what I'm going to do, man? So I don't miss these ever again. I'm gonna open up a text document and I'm gonna copy paste all of them the moment I see it. This way, I don't freaking lose them. <laughs> Am I Greek? Yes, 50%. Actually, I did um, the ancestry thing. It got updated a few days ago, and I discovered some new things about my origins that were pretty interesting to say the least. So if you guys want to find out. I mean, I could show you, you know, so check it out, bro. Ooh. You guys can see that. So, oh, and the, and the Italian too. Ooh. So 53% Southern Italian, 34% Greece and Albania. 8% Asian islands, 2% Balkans, 2% Germanic Europe, and 1% Eastern Europe and Russia. That's a hell of a combination. <laughs> you know, back then it was it just said Greek and Italian, but it's been updated with these little things. So that, that those are my origins, guys. Updated officially. What do you think about that? Italian, uh, yeah, 53% Italian. So I'm, I'm mostly Italian, but uh, the other stuff is all over Europe, you know? Speak Italian, speak Italian. I don't speak it, bro. I tried, um, I took a course uh, like a few years ago and I ended up forgetting everything about it. You gotta practice language. And live with people who are constantly speaking the language or else it's not going to happen. Uh, did you know you had lots of Italian heritage? Of course. My mother's uh, basically all Italian. She has a small amount of Greek, but she's Italian. My, my father's 100% Greek. And my mother's Italian. And then there's the little stuff that's just part of your DNA from way back. It gets mixed in. But I'm, I'm that mix, man. I'm, I'm, I'm Greek-Italian. Yeah, you're quite Southern Eastern European. Yeah. That's basically the mix. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm proud of it, man. I've always uh, enjoyed that mix. We got good food. Both cultures. <laughs> and, I, I, and Italians and Greeks are both... Uh, Greek-Italian, yeah. 
No, I like them a lot. Okay, I got this question right here. Hey, bro, I was overweight around 23, 25% body fat. I've been cutting for around three months and I'm around 17, 19%. Should I bulk now? Uh, the thing is, you're doing really good, right? You went from overweight, where you're saying 23, 25%. Let's just say 25 and you got down to 17. That's a lot of weight loss. Alex is your girlfriend black. No, she's uh, mostly Sicilian, actually. All from the South, Southern Italian. All right, back to this question. Hey, bro, I was overweight. So look, that's, um, do you really want to get overweight again? Like, it must have felt like garbage weighing that much, right? Like, I can speak from experience as well. I was probably around 23% at the uh, peak of my bulk. It's not a good feeling, you know? I, I would, and, and because you're 17 to 19%, how long are you going to bulk for? Like realistically, you're, you're gonna be around 20 in like a month or two, like easy. So you're basically gonna undo some of the progress of your cut. And the way that I see it, being at this body fat, which might actually be a, a wrong estimation, you can probably gain muscle still. Like real talk, why don't you cut down to 15% body fat? Like basically whatever your high values are, you say 23 to 25, right? I bet you're 25. You're saying right now you're 17 to 19. I bet you're 19. Even though that contradicts what I said before, but I digress. Check it. Push it more. Maybe cut for another two and a half months. Get down to a legit 15% body fat. And then you can do a very slow bulk. But you're going to be right back to being overweight in no time at all. You know, the time frame, like it sounds to me like you did it correctly. A three-month cut, reasonable weight loss. But what's going to happen with a reasonable weight gain? It's going to be the same time frame, man. Like basically, there's no point is what I'm saying. You should be milking this cut, which is already going super well. Like this is the progress that I like to see. And I want to keep, I want to keep it that way for you. So that would be my personal advice, man. Continue losing weight. You're doing well. All right, super chat repost. I appreciate that, man. I saw your question before as well. <laughs> yeah, this this notepad method works. That's how we're gonna do it moving forward, boys. So don't worry about losing your super chat. You made a video about training muscle at home with 135. How would you go about doing a 50 pound dumbbells? Very easy. So for the um, dumbbell benching, you're gonna wanna put a band behind you. So maybe a mini band or a monster mini band. That's gonna make it somewhere around 70 something at the top. And it's gonna emphasize the short position ever so slightly more. So any dumbbell bench with bands is good. Overhead press, most of you can probably milk it with 50 pounds without back support. Like if you do it correctly, full range of motion, you know, just pressing this way, that's going to be pretty difficult. If you do something like three sets of 15 or just 12, 15, somewhere in that range. So I'd recommend like high reps on that. And then uh, you can also include like dumbbell chest fly presses. So you come out to the side like this and then you press. So you're just, you're stretching at the bottom, but you're not pressing normally. Like you're not just doing a dumbbell bench. You're doing a fly, but then you're kind of pressing out of it at the same time, if that makes sense. With that, 50 pounds is gonna get a lot in for you. And then for legs, lunges is pretty much the best thing I can think of. Maybe some banded RDLs as well with two dumbbells in your hand, you know? For the squats, like you can do what? Uh, like some people would say goblet squats, but I don't think 50 pounds in each hand is gonna be enough. I, I would say a pistol squat is probably better. So maybe do like a 10 inch pistol squat, like 10 inch box squat, but you have two 50 pound dumbbells in your hands. That is gonna do more for you than a goblet squat in my opinion. You know, it's more stable for like compared to regular pistols for one. And it's harder than the lunge. So if you find that those 50 pounders are too light for doing higher reps of lunges, maybe it being in the 20 range, 
For pistols, it's going to be enough. So those are will be some generalized movements. Oh, and, and for the isolation work, obviously 50 pound dumbbells is going to be enough. You know, you can do everything with that. Your curls, you're, you're fine. Uh, if you're doing side laterals, rear delt flies, all that stuff. Okay. But if you want, I can make a video talking about, uh, what do you call it? How to get jacked with 50 pound dumbbells. Like what's a realistic dumbbell weight that most people have access to? Would you say it's 40 pound dumbbells, 50 dumbbells, 45 pounds? Like what's the average? Like let's hear some feedback right now before I answer some more questions. Yo guys, what's the most common like dumbbell pair that people have? Cause I can make a video on this. Keep on killing it fam. Of course, 30 pounds, 45, 45 for sure. 50, 25, 20, 30, 35, 40, 25, 20 or 30, maybe 50 pounds, 25, 15 to 40, 45. So the, the maximum number I'm seeing here, some guys are saying 50, but 45 is where guys are generally capping at. 20 to 30, I see, I see. Yeah, so the range is basically 25 to 50. Like that's what we're talking about here. So I can make a video how to get jacked with 45 pound dumbbells. <laughs> you know? I, I suppose I would have to base it off the kilo conversion. Whatever looks better in a title. So 45 pounds is... 20.4 kilos and 20 kilos is 44 pounds. So yeah, you know what? I would do 45 pounds. How to get jacked with 45 20 pound kilo dumbbells. I think that's fair. Who, who the fuck owns 45 is law? <laughs> I don't know, bro. I don't even have adjustable dumbbells, so I wouldn't know. Weighted Nordics are the truth. Of course, if you can do them, I can't even do one non-weighted and I'm a pretty strong guy, so. What does that say? Uh, how about an upper body ring workout? I, I did do one actually for the uh, chest a few months ago. If you guys are interested, it was like a short. Let me just paste it in for you guys. It was called a ring, killer ring chest workout. So you can watch that. Uh, but keep in mind, it was only for the chest. If you want a, like a more complete session, I would also include uh, tricep work, direct ring extensions. Fasting effect on hormones. Uh, your cortisol will go up. And also, what's that? Uh, your growth hormone apparently raises like 2,000%. The thing is, though, these values don't matter because we're just talking about fluctuations. At the end of the day, like it's not gonna have a, a massive impact on your physique, you know, and, and, and fasting is inherently like, you're not eating any food. So even if there is a hormonal improve very temporarily, you're certainly not gaining muscle when you're not eating anything. So it, it cancels each other out basically. Big fan here, I have a question. I'm having a hard time seeing a 10% body fat, a three month cut. Now my caloric intake is 2,300, 2,500, but I'm still hungry every day. How can I stop it? Oh, well, you're at 10% body fat. A lot of guys are gonna have trouble maintaining that just off the leanness factor itself. Now, the thing is, your caloric intake is 2,300, 2,500. That's not bad because I had to go even below that when I was in your range. So, Maybe just the the type of food you're eating is not optimal. Like you probably got to have a lot more protein, not not for um, muscle gain because that's extremely overhyped, but just for satiation purposes. And in general, having more micronutrient rich fo rich foods on the side to complement everything is gonna be beneficial. So as well as swaps. So let's say you have uh, pasta, right? Switch it to whole wheat. Reduce the oil that's in the pasta. This way, you're gonna be able to eat like more food, but still hit the same calories. And 
consider like adding beans to it as well. So pasta fagiol, right? Or um, if there's already meat in the sauce, you can mix in beans at the same time. That's gonna really enhance the entire meal. And then you wanna think of pairing it with vegetables like mixed in. So a lot of guys, they're gonna have the pasta, which is like the main course, like everything is in there. And then they're gonna have a little salad on the side when they're done, you know? Or it's gonna be really meat heavy plus pasta heavy. What I'm saying is have like a 50-50 ratio of beans to meat. And the pasta itself should be whole grain. And then the vegetables should exceed the actual pasta itself. Basically, your reverse, like the, the portions, like Dr. Longo talked about this in his book, The Longevity Diet. You're eating the same stuff, still getting extremely similar calories, but the ratio of the foods, volume-wise, are different. Does that make sense? So you don't actually have to change much in your diet. You just got to change the, the quantities per meal ratio-wise. And the pasta thing is the best example I can give you right now. Yo, were there other uh, super chats that I missed? If there is, please repost it right now. More or less wait. For sure. Uh, rep range for volume days doesn't, it can be uh, in the eight to 12 range, 12 to 15, 15 to 20. It doesn't really matter to be honest with you. I, I generally look at percentages over rep ranges. So for volume training, that's going to be anywhere between 35% of your one rep max all the way up to 75% of your one rep max. You don't need 80 or above if you're just trying to get big. Like real talk, that that's going to be your cap. And I would say like on average, you're going to be 70%. That's like the, the optimal level for most people. If you're doing more sets, you might be around 60%, maybe 55. Like the more, the more sets you're doing on one movement, the lower the percentage is gonna have to be if you wanna maintain a similar RPE. Otherwise you're gonna see it gradually go down, you know, which is nothing wrong with that, but I'm just saying. So I, I would just, I would sum up my answer like this. 50 to 75% of your one rep max for reps is likely the correct zone. Okay. Hey Alex, what do you say to people who like their muscles are really small when they're cutting? It makes me want to go into a bulk even though I'm overweight. Yeah, that's the uh, body dysmorphia that kicks in because you're so used to being bigger, you know, wearing bigger clothes, just filling in your t-shirts and the muscle measurement is physically bigger because there's fat around it. So like when you cut down, you're loose, you know, and you actually are smaller because we all have way more, way more fat than we thought, you know? So when I was shredded to the bone, man, like actual, my arms were 15 inches. So that's not a big measurement, but when I flexed, it looked big because it was so, the skin was tight. The bicep shape was like really nice too. You can actually see it. And it just like when, every, when there's no fat on any outer extremities of the body and you're flexing, like you got this, this symmetry, you know? It looks really good. So you gotta look at the big picture as opposed to like individualized areas. Like, oh, I'm a bit smaller. Yeah, that is fact. You, you are smaller, but how does that affect the overall look? You know, like, Take pictures with your shirt off, you know, far away from the camera. See if it's a, if it's as big as a, of a difference as you're making it out to be. Because usually, we can be our own worst critics based off feeling. There's a feeling that you're small, and just you're not quite as big, but you can still look jacked enough. Is what I'm saying. So what I would say is follow through your cut all the way till the end. Just freaking finish it. It's going to suck. And uh, em enjoy suffering through that body dysmorphia because maybe that's what you need. Maybe you, you, you got to really like 
get so sucked up that you realize, damn, this is not for me. I don't want to be shredded. I don't want to be 10% body fat. Let me just stick to being 12, 15. But you won't really appreciate it until you get down to the depths of hell, aka being shredded. Not saying that I'm promoting being shredded, but just see what you're capable of, you know? And if you really can't handle it, by the time you're stupid lean, you just, you feel so weak and depleted and small that you're like, nah, never again, then you do you. But you set a goal for yourself, stick to it, follow through, man. Angelica Laflamme, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate that. You... You answered. You asked me a question. Hey, Alpha, I've been making gains for a year now, but I've been chronically under-recovering due to a lack of sleep, stress. What's a good way to get back on track with programming after hitting the wall? Um, which version of the wall are you talking about? Are you just trolling me by saying that part? Or are you saying you've hit a wall in the sense that <laughs> it's related to your lifestyle? I'm assuming that's what you mean. So... You've been not sleeping and constantly being stressed. Okay. Have you tried to address that? Like stress, there's many things that can affect that. Uh, I don't know if I can necessarily help you with what's going on in your life with those particular factors. Other than to... Because sometimes stress is, is inevitable, right? There's people who come into your life that, you know, are relatively toxic or they don't really uplift you they don't bring you anything in particular so if you're able to recognize that they're not helping you in any kind of way then you have to have the intestinal fortitude to just drop them out so that's one important factor to it but if you know like you're gonna be working a lot do your job uh there's certain people that can't necessarily be cut out. Maybe there's someone at your work who pisses you off or it just is what it is. Like the truth is life is going to be stressful and there's nothing you can do about it. Then obviously there's nothing to say about the stress element. You know, you can try to do certain anti-stress uh, exercises. You can take up a certain sport that alleviates you. You know, some people are going to turn to drugs, but I don't recommend that. You can turn to self-improvement, try to get your mind distracted. I don't know what I could say on the stress aspect. But what I will say on the sleep is that you do have control. And there are people who make videos on even the most stubborn of cases of insomnia. And if you if you get that part taken care of, like you can be stressed out of your mind. Like everything is going wrong in your life. But if you're getting those eight hours a night, Yes, practicing stoicism is very beneficial, absolutely. But look, if you're getting those eight hours a night and your programming is really on point, even uh, lowering fatigue by focusing on stimulus to fatigue and having a sustainable system that's not gonna like break you down, maybe like a three-day program, something like that, then it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. Brian Alsu, for example, absolutely. Brian's a great example. You know, he pukes like five times a day and uh, he's been through a lot. With, hosp with, with hospitalizations and battling his illnesses, but he still goes after it every single day. So things are gonna be hard in life at times, but what can you do about it, you know? If there's no solution, what can you do? Whereas sleep is like, you can take melatonin. Get some, you know? Uh, you probably don't need more than a very small dose, like a milligram, but some people recommend super physiological doses of melatonin five to 10 milligrams. And I've heard Leo from Longevity suggest even higher amounts. Um, and he talks about a specific pathway that could be uh, beneficial for longevity. I forgot what that was about, but melatonin, uh, ZMA, like magnesium, you know, and read the book, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. I feel like if you can get the sleep under control, your, your brain's gonna be more clear, for one. You're going to recover from your sessions. And you know what? Maybe it will help your stress at the same time. Because when you're chronically fatigued and you just you don't feel like yourself, you're just freaking tired, and then there's bullshit on top of your lifestyle, that just makes things work uh, worse. So 
if you can at least control the sleep, I think that's probably the biggest change you can make to your life above all else. So I, I would start by researching everything you need to know about that subject. And uh, other than that, like follow a basic system that's, uh, you know, I don't know what your training experience is like, where you're, where you're at, but no more than three, four days a week. Like if you're, uh, yeah, you don't, you don't need to do a super high frequency system, nothing trendy, just follow a basic program, upper, lower, that's fine. Super chat repost. How can I slim down my powerlifting legs for Muay Thai? Just want more speed. Just gotta lose weight. Um, like this, the speed. Like the thing is, the the research seems to indicate that the stronger your legs are, the more beneficial it is for explosive type activities, right? Because the percentage of your wonder max is so low that you can produce, uh, like the velocity is gonna be higher. So I wouldn't say your powerlifting legs are a detriment, you know, but maybe the body fat that you gain from powerlifting is a bit of a problem. Or uh, you should now use that strength in a more specific way. So in your case, my man, I don't know what program you ran in the past, but if you switch to conjugate or you start introducing the dynamic effort method as a part of your weekly training system, those waves are going to allow you to actualize your strength for explosiveness. So you don't have to lose the performance is what I'm saying. If you squat like 500 pounds and now you're going to do like three week waves. So 500 at like 35%, that's like 175 pounds, which is, you know, it's nothing heavy, but when you use those loads, 12 sets of two with 175 and you got the accommodating resistance to reduce body acceleration, that's going to make a big difference in like using that freaking muscle for something. So it's it's honestly fine, man. Like don't lose your strength. I would say it's a mistake to in to intentionally get weaker. Now is the time to do dynamic effort. And that's going to be even better, <laughs> you know, than trying to shrink. So other than that, uh, fat loss is really the way to do things and in introducing some plyometric type stuff as well. Like check out uh, Alec on Curie. He shows you some um, some of his drills that he does, which includes like snatch grip, high pulls, specific kinds of uh, sprints, kettlebell swings, uh, the prowler, like you just got to introduce some of that stuff with some DE work and you're going to be just fine, man. You don't have to worry about powerlifting holding you back. If anything, it's going to make you better. And if you look at a lot of uh, MMA fighters in the actual UFC, bro, look who's training them. Phil DeRue, he's a conjugate promoter. And you see these guys, like Dustin Poirier, that guy does a lot of dynamic effort. So the, the squatting is only making him a better fighter. All right. Jake the Snake, thank you for the donation, man. I appreciate that. Now, uh, you guys are lucky. I uh, I copy-pasted your questions, so I didn't lose them this time. See, that that's the solution, or else uh, it doesn't work. Thanks, brother. We'll check out this program. It's awesome, dude. Hey, Alex. Uh, I'm going to get this one in as well. My God. I want to start wrapping up in a bit, but I got like 10 questions I got to go through. So let me just do that. Yo, I am Nova. I got your question saved. Don't worry about it, okay? Just going to get to it. Hey, Alex. I know you've made a video about this, but I wonder if you can talk more about this. So the question is, I'm still an intermediate lifter but I'm still skinny fat. So my question is, what's going on? 80 kilos, 179 height. Well, the thing is, man, we all respond differently to training. And you're talking, you're saying you're an intermediate lifter under what context? Because if I look at the EX, EXRX chart, some of those intermediate numbers is not what I would necessarily call intermediate numbers if we're going to even reference standards at all, right? So how about we go through some of these numbers together just to give you an idea. So let's do this. So I'm going to go bench press, deadlift, OHB, squat. So for the bench press, 
And uh, actually, you 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 mentioned in kilos. So what's your kilos right here? Eighty kilograms, you know. So you're a bit under uh, two hundred pounds, or well, whatever. I, I fucking suck at calculating that shit, but whatever. Let's so check it out. So intermediate. Let's say you're like you're this. You're in this range, right? That's like a two hundred bench, you know, one eighty five. Like you're in this zone, one one eighty five, two hundred, two fifteen. For a one rep max, that's not really gonna get you a massive chest, bro. Like it's a good base, it's a good starting point, but this is only the beginning. You know, it's not like it's nothing crazy or unrealistic. A lot of guys have benches like this, and they don't have the best physiques. So just off that, especially from the weight itself, like you know, you can do better than that. So the thing is, you, you have to be realistic about about your expectations. Deadlift. Again, in this zone right here, three plates, 335. Have you seen all the skinny guys who can pull even like above that, maybe 410, you know? This isn't anything crazy. Like, like I know a lot of you guys are proud of hitting that, but you can do way more. Press. See, the, 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 the overhead press is not bad, to be honest. That's a harder one to do, you know? And I would say it makes the most sense. Out of every standard here, like these ones are actually realistic. Uh, your shoulders shouldn't look too bad, you know, but your your, your pecs definitely not going to be massive. And then uh, the squat, 270, 285, you know, uh, what what's going to be your um, percentage work off that? So let's say you're 270 at 70%. So you're doing like 185-ish for sets of 10. It's not bad, man, but... Like that's why you don't have massive legs. There's, it's nothing, it's nothing crazy. You got to do 100 pounds above this, most likely, or at least somewhere in the 200s. You know, like you're not gonna have tree trunks doing that amount. So like you say you're you're skinny fat, but the question is, uh, to what extent are you skinny fat? Like, is it really as bad as you're claiming? Have you taken before and after pictures? Like, how? What's the measure? What's the measurement differences like? I'm sure you've put on some muscle, just probably not to the expectations that you thought. And then there's other factors to consider, like um, your genetics. Like, let's keep it real. Some guys are going to have some of these intermediate numbers, and it's not going to show to the same extent as someone who's a little bit weaker. It is what it is. Even if, like, regardless if it was a hypertrophy style program or strength training, like, if your numbers are just okay, you know, that's probably not going to be the biggest. So honestly, dude, it just sounds to me like maybe you don't realize how much your physique has improved to begin with. And secondly, your expectations of what good numbers are to look a certain way is off. Like you're going to have to go way beyond what you're currently at. And that's when it's really going to show. And then finally, maybe you just got to do a cut, bro. Maybe you're not actually skinny fat. But you're just kind of bulked, but a little bit over bulked for your current musculature. So you, you bloat max to a certain extent, and it's hiding a lot of definition. And maybe the way you store fat is unfavorable. So your pecs don't look that good. Your shoulders don't have that cap because there's the fat covering it, obviously. Like we all store things, we all store fat a bit differently. So combined with everything I just talked about, like I'm not surprised. Like it's not like you're telling me, yo, Alex, I hit advance on all these numbers. And I look like I don't live, you know, like you're saying you're still skinny fat, but even that is vague in itself. So to me, man, it's just going to take some more time and maybe a mini cut will get you right, you know. All right, next question. We're going to start wrapping up soon, okay? No more super chats, please. Uh... My man Noah, best way to get to 225 straight to OHB. Best was 185 at 172. That's really good, man. Missed some training, so back down to 160. No access to bands or chains. Oh, dude. Okay, so look, you don't need the bands or chains. Uh, did I use them to get my 225 OHB? Yes. I found that the chain work was really beneficial, and I, I would even um, overhead press with that. You know, not just for the closer bench with the bands and chains. 
But OHP with with uh, chain tension is insane. Like if you have sixty pounds of chains, with uh, not even a, a a lot of overhead press weight, like ninety five or something, anywhere anywhere between ninety five and one twenty five plus sixty chain, you do that for reps, it's tough. Let me tell you. So you don't need to calm down resistance, and already you've done a lot, right? What I'll tell you is that it's gonna take a very long time to get to that next level. Uh, you're gonna regain that 180, and 185 is gonna happen in a short amount of time, if you ask me. But the journey between 185 and 225 is massive. Like it's it's very, very difficult. Like 200 to 205, sorry, 200 pounds to 225 can take more than a year. It can take years. It can take two to three years, depending on the lifter. The OHP is one of those lifts where stability and the motion itself is so like limiting in the sense that adding five pounds a year at that level, at that body weight, could be tough. It's, you know, it's not easy, man. So to me, like where, where you are right now to where you wanna be, that's, that's a three-year transformation. So exercises aside, my number one answer is consistency. Like you cannot be missing training. You cannot be doing this yo-yo stuff. You have to continually get better and better, right? Now, what I can tell you is volume overhead press is extremely beneficial. And I found it to be even better than lower repetitions because a lot of the carryover you're going to get from your flat pressing. And therefore, if you're going to do something for vol, if you're going to work on the overhead press, why not train the movement pattern with more repetitions? Uh, less form breakdown, less uh, grinders that affect your recovery. So to me, man, I just do classic three sets of six to 10 and change the specialty barbells. So you milk the regular overhead press for as long as you can. Then you start doing pauses and then you introduce the Swiss bar version with like a medium grip. Rotate throughout those three variations, coupled with maybe the dumbbell version as well, and you're good in terms of exercise selection. It doesn't take much if you're not going to use a combining resistance. Oh, and of course, the uh, pin overhead press. So set the pins like to where you want to, like to where your normal starting position is. So if you press this way instead of like off the chest, put the pins right there and just you do your dead stop presses like that. It's specific, you know? And hit that for reps. And then there's the seated version, uh, which is more stable. And you can typically lift heavier weights. And I would actually recommend, like, uh, not 100% vertical, but on a super high incline. Because that's going to allow for more lengthening of the anterior delts. And if that's what's holding you back on the OHB, not necessarily triceps and upper back, that's going to be specific motion. Finally, I would tell you to do the... I'm not gonna say behind the neck press, even though it's a very effective movement, but the non-back supported seated overhead press. So that's a better version of the Z press. It's more stable, you can be lifting similar lows, just a little bit less. You can get slightly more out of less weight. So that, that would be more specific than the other movements I talked about. And that's what I would milk for a long time, man. I'm out of here. Yo, thanks for stopping by, bro. Have a good one. We appreciate the content. Much love. All right, next question. Okay. Can I keep the exercise the same on intensity and volume days while I change every two to three weeks? Can I add third leg session in the week very light? Yeah, you could. You're, the only thing is you're going to have to change it every two to three weeks, like you just said. So basically, the more frequently you keep in a motion, the more you got to swap it out with concurrent periodization specifically. If you're not running this type of periodization, then you can go much longer than three weeks. It's just the fact that because we're keeping our volume and intensity high throughout the yearly training cycle, we're more subject to developing overuse injuries. And plateaus will kick in very fast, especially for the heavy work. So to prevent aches and pains and just keep progression smooth, 
you have to rotate. Like this is exclusive to concurrent for what you're referencing right now. So I think every two to three would be perfectly fine. Uh, that's kind of what I do myself as well when I have my exercises that frequent. So you, you got it figured out there. Now regarding the third leg movement, um, you could, but I don't see the point to be honest. Like if you're doing a volume and intensity day for your lower body, you're good, man. Like you got twice a week frequency. Um, there's not gonna be any junk volume in either either of those sessions. You don't need a third session, man. Realistically, you don't. I would actually recommend uh, GPP instead of like doing some light squats or whatever. Like, I suppose the only benefit would be maybe some belt squats at a really low percentage, like occluded belt squats, <laughs> or just stick in you know, around 50% tops, maybe lower than that. And then doing banded accessories, like band leg curls, band leg extensions, something like that would be fine. But like a, an actual like full blown session, just, you know, at a slightly less intense intensity. Ah, wouldn't recommend it, man. But I, I think overall you're in a good position. Joseph Martinez, no question, just wanted to buy you a vegan burrito or something to say thanks for the years of free and useful content. Yo, I appreciate that, man, and I, I got to get back to veganism, you know? I, I did, like I said before earlier in this q and I did really well on the diet. I felt healthy as hell. I know it's the correct path, and I do see myself doing it long term, like all the way. I'm not 100% right now. I'm like 80, 90%. But I know this is the correct path. And I, and I appreciate you stopping by, showing some love, and still, you know, sticking with me. Because a lot of guys, uh, when you're no longer 100%, they don't like that, you know. And you know exactly what I'm doing ethically. So, much love to you. Thank you for stopping by. If you got questions, I'm definitely here for you as well. Oh, did I see Massive Iron? Massive Iron. Steve Shaw, how you doing, man? I'm happy you stopped by. Hope, hope all is well, man. And you've been making really good videos recently. As always, always grinding, always kicking ass. I respect you a lot, Steve. And de definitely would love to uh, go back on your podcast again soon. All right, your mic is buzzing. Are you serious? Hold on. Is it better now, guys? Thanks. All good. Much love. Much love, Steve. And and keep embracing health. I know it's important. You overcame some things recently. You're doing good. Um, Sakwat Rahman. How come you didn't name your channel Alexander Leonidas? That's a badass name. So the thing is, dude... I created the channel Alpha Destiny at a very young age, and like I, <laughs> I, I guess because I was like really young, I didn't want my name to be the the, the main thing. But eventually, it became that anyway. So I should have. But the problem is that I developed a reputation as Alpha Destiny through years of being in this business. You know, you go, you type Alpha Destiny on YouTube. There's a bunch of things lined up: Alpha Destiny 405, Alpha Destiny Pull Up, OHP. Like people know the brand. And my concern is that the algorithm would screw me over if I change my name to Alex Leonidas or Alexander Leonidas. I'd love to do that, to be honest with you. I think that is like where I want to lean. I want it to be less about like alpha. If anything, like if I look at my life, objectively speaking, it's kind of a meme right now, but I've always been Sigma. Like if, if, if we want to use those terms, which I don't subscribe to any of that stuff, but that's been, I've been a textbook Sigma since... I'm like 15 years old. Realistically, man, that's been me to the freaking letter. Everything, every trade I can think of. But I wouldn't even use that because I find all those things to be cringy, including the term alpha, but it is what it is, right? That's the name I, I chose at the time. So I would love to do Al Alexander, but I'm just really concerned that YouTube's not gonna recommend my stuff as a result or that a lot of my videos would get buried, you know? Like I want people to still find, like I want to be paired with my name. I want people to see all my, my original works as Alexander, not Alpha Destiny, you know? So I'm probably gonna do it regardless just cause I, I want to, but it is a little bit of a concern, not gonna lie. 
But uh, eventually, man, it, high chance it's going to happen. Change it to Alexander. Sigma grind set, Sigma Destiny 100. Sigmas are a rare male breed. You're lucky, Alex. Yeah, I didn't know what the hell it was until like a year ago or something. And I was like, oh shit, that's me. To the letter. That might happen because it's platforms oriented by tags. Yeah. Alexandro. That's what my grandmother used to call me on the Greek side. All right. <laughs> yeah, of course I've seen those, man. I, you know, I was very young. What do you think? Like, did you guys not act in stupid ways when you were younger? It is what it is. You won't see any of that now in 2022 because I've matured and... Uh, I'm a grown-ass man with my shit together, man. Yo, Alex, love the content, especially collabs with NH. On that note, what are your thoughts on Nucleus Overload training? So I actually talked about Nucleus Overload earlier on in this uh, this video. <laughs> Basically, I like Megan of Team 3D Alpha a lot. We actually did a collab as well years back. He was one of my original, you know, motivations I used to watch his channel, Low Budget Lean Muscle, and he gave me a shout out when I just started growing out my uh, my channel, you know? Like I had less than a thousand subs. He he mentioned me, you know, and we always went back and forth and I've always had respect for Megan. And Nucleus Overload was his baby to the point where he originally called it overtraining. Like he didn't he didn't even have a name for it. He was still in the process of creating it. He was describing the science of the satellite cells and the workers and the muscles. But he's like, I don't even know what to talk about. I didn't even know how to call this, you know? He was all like, but then <laughs> by interacting with his fans, he came to the name Nucleus Overload, which was so freaking cool, and I got to see that. So I'm always going to respect what he's brought to the fitness community, which is a massive contribution, and everybody knows about it now. So do I think it works? What do you think? Megan's my boy, and of course, a lot of guys have had great results with that. Even NH discuss about it, you know? So the results uh, speak for themselves. It's very anecdotal, but you know, how about you just try it and see if it works? And in, in terms of like executing it, man, I, I like doing it with cables and bands. Anything that emphasizes the uh, shortened position where you're getting more squeeze-based motions and less like compound focus. So all about the isolations. So like banded chest flies, band push downs, band curls, because you're accomplishing two goals at the same time. You know, you're getting the connective tissue bigger, or thicker rather, and volume in the muscle that needs work. Yeah, bands are great for nucleus overload. Absolutely, dude. That's how I like it. Or you use a low percentage with like dumbbells or something like that. What are your thoughts on Doug Brignoli's book? Or are you more of an N1 education guy? <laughs> That's a good question, Magnus. So I actually read Doug's book. And I found it to be very informative. I don't agree with all the conclusions in there, but uh, I, I enjoyed reading it for sure. And I am subscribed to the channel. Uh, regarding N1 education, fuck yeah, man. I'm, I'm N1 all the way. Uh, Coach Kasim is honestly changing my life in terms of the advice he provides and his breakdowns, his deep discussions. It's so His content is so good. If you, if you guys like actually go through it objectively, even go on the website, the N1 training, and you go through the exercise library and you see the, the explanations for training the shortened and length of position, you know, using different positions as leverage, like, oh my God, it's insane. This is biomechanics to the next level in an applied way for lifting. So I, I mess heavy with N1, you know, I, to be honest, guys, it might be, it, it might be the only course I'm ever going to buy. Like I'm, I've been highly considering it. Like going on the N1 education website and, and buying out like everything, you know, it would probably run me a few thousand, but for the, for the education, like I've already learned so much from his free stuff. So the premium route, I would probably do it. Real talk, that's how much I respect Coach Kasim and I'd love to get him on the channel as well. I'm probably going to hit him up in a bit, but to me, he is the number one source for biomechanics information, hands down. All right. My man, Bald Omni Man, of course. Yo, Bald Omni Man is the truth. He's gonna get you right. Super strong and jacked. And uh, his, his, his information, he's extremely knowledgeable, man. Can't recommend his stuff enough. 
Hey Alex, I know you made a video about this. I wonder if you can talk more about this. Question is, I'm still intermediate. Oh, I already answered this, sorry. Uh, Texas Method Thoughts, best power building program for intermediates. So I actually used the Texas Method years ago and it was probably the worst program I ever ran in my life. I had uh, all kinds of overuse issues and it didn't do shit for my bench. Um, it, it, it I, I don't like it, bro. The, the only thing I like it as is a bridging uh, type of system for like going into the intermediate stage or milking something that's a bit more basic for a tiny amount of time, like maybe one to three months tops. But even then, like maximum three months, I would not run that program longer than that and still know that it's not optimal. So that's why if you go on my site, I'm going to show you guys this, okay? Because this is one of the, this is something that I sought to <laughs> overcome with the Texas method, okay? Check this out, guys. This is very important. This is my website. See this? Alpha Destiny Novice Intermediate Hybrid Program. This is basically my novice program and the Texas method combined. And this is me doing the cheat rows back in the day. I think that was my first time doing seven plates or something. Look at the traps, the way to stretch, bro. It actually makes sense with the way to stretch, by the way, because the body's horizontal and it's pulling, but then you're getting scapular retraction. So it's pretty much all traps. You're not even getting your lats with this shit, except for maybe the length of position. But anyway, um, so basically this whole system was designed to complement whatever you're good or sucky at for upper or lower. So let's say you hit... Um, Upper body. So version one is for those that achieve the 225 bench, but not a 315 squat. Basically, if you were a gym bro, okay, and you can bench two plates for reps, but your lower body sucks, then you run this, which is basically a continuation of the novice program, but it's very Texas method-ish in its programming. Like if you actually analyze it, you're gonna see it, it basically is the Texas method. <laughs> you know, not that it's copy paste or me trying to copy it, but I just use it as a bridging system, if you understand what I'm saying. Just so that you can allow the upper body, sorry, you allow the lower body to catch up a bit, but your upper body gets a bit more like linear progression that still works. So you're not gonna plateau completely, but you're still gonna make gains. Does that make sense? So that's the only application that I would have for it. But as a, a program in isolation, I would not uh, recommend it, man. Uh, do you ever see Eric Bogenhagen's 225 pistol squat? That's the best lift I've ever seen. I, I wouldn't call it the best lift I've ever seen. From Eric, um, I would say I'm most impressed by his 880 pound behind the back deadlift. That was the lift that blew my freaking mind. Also, the 910 trap bar was really awesome to see. Uh, yeah, those two, those two stuck out. But the 225 uh, pistol squat... He did that on a box, right? With the SSB. So it's kind of a different lift, but still impressive as hell. Like I know uh, his legs are definitely stronger than um, like Clarence's pistol squat. All right. Joseph Martinez. Oh yeah, I already got you before. Thank you. So we've officially covered all the super chats. So I'm gonna answer uh, a few more questions and then uh, we're gonna be done, okay? Overall, I've been very pleased with all you guys today. This was a really cool Q&A. Fuck, it went by fast. How much are your custom programs? So go on the site, outalpha.com slash contact. If you want to learn more information about that. Bench off with Bald Omni-Man and rematch with Jeff Nipper. That would be fun, man. Um... So Bald Omni Man, I'd love to meet him in person and get a workout in. I think that'd be really fun. We could vibe it out, shoot the shit, you know, maybe go to buffet. You know, just talk, train. He's a good dude. I feel like he's someone that I can get along with. And then for what we already do in, in terms of us going back and forth on social media, uh, DMs, the video chat we had, like overall good vibes from him. So absolutely game to um, more than a bench off though, to be honest, because He's strong at a lot of stuff, like weighted pull-ups, and I think it'd be a fun, friendly competition, or collaboration, rather. 
like what he did with that guy recently, the the gym nemesis dude, you know, something like that. Jeff Nippard, absolutely, you know, I can I can go over to Toronto anytime, uh, not a problem. Even Omar Issa, if I be game, those two guys I have a lot of respect for. And Jeff is on the way to benching four plates. I do believe he's gonna get it. He recently hit 380. I I first did a, a 385 bench in 2020 like a proper one so that and then a year later i got the 405 so based off that jeff is very close he's he's, he's basically like right there you know he's gonna get it what do you think about fasting in ramadan so i made a video about ramadan a few years ago i'm not muslim but i know a lot of you guys are and you wanted my advice on how to actually train and get results while fasting for Ramadan. So check it out, man. And even check out the comment section. There's a lot of advice from you guys who went back and forth. So I think that's going to be helpful. Uh, D-Load tips, cut volume or intensity. So I like to use low percentages of, of my one rep max. I, this is actually my D-Load week right now. Though that kind of failed when I did that... Uh, <laughs> One of my recent videos because I had to do so many pull-ups that I got sore in my biceps and back. Like, it was actually wrecked. But anyway, I would tell you to use like 40%, 45% tops of your one rep max. And maybe instead of doing three sets, you can drop it down to two. And then for the accessories, you can do like <laughs> one set of curls or something like that. You know, just a little something. Because the thing is, isolation work can be stressful on the joints in itself, you know. Yo, Yash, I was actually talking about you before, you know, but uh, I couldn't find any of your questions. So now you're given a golden opportunity before we get off. So how about you repost your question, homie? I've been trying to, I've been trying to help you, but whenever I do control F, I don't see your, I don't see it. Full body versus upper lower, whatever you prefer. If you can handle full body you have the work capacity, then you can go really far. I switched to upper lower basically at the start of 2020. So before that was all full body with the exception of me being lazy on some aspects of leg training. Like sometimes I would just skip the lower body completely or I would be very lazy on it. Like I would just do pistol squats, uh, maintenance mode. I didn't, I didn't really train the lower body hard so my, it was basically upper body with some lower sprinkled in there, you know, but I, I did get really good results for years um, doing full body. And I, and I have all kinds of, like if you guys check out, I'm gonna reference you uh, my best physique, my best physique or physique update, that's what it was, physique update. If you guys check out this video, okay, that's what I look like doing full body training. That's 2019. Look at that body. That's, uh, yeah, that's a full body physique. So you can get really, really far. Don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. This is what the old school grades did. This is where I got my motivation. It was from Leroy Colbert, Steve Reeves, all the grades from back then, man. So I, I took it really, really far. But now, man, I need... I need that upper lower or else I'm just going to skip legs. And you know what? I'm really enjoying the squat training. And I'm not going to combine. Uh, like you see my workouts. They're very difficult. I'm not going to do all that in one session. So I, I got what I needed out of it. But I, I don't train like that currently. And there is a full body template in Naturally Enhanced, by the way. So don't think I'm against. Sorry, there's an upper lower in Naturally Enhanced. Don't think I'm against it. <coughs> Thanks, man. No problem. Uh, current lower body goals. 500 squat is the main one. Um, and I'm, like I said, it's going really well so far. Steve Reeves and Ju Eugene Sandow are goals. Yeah, I would say Steve Reeves is major goals. And even uh, George Hackenschmidt. He had a crazy physique. And he's the one who created the behind-the-back deadlift. He did over 700 pounds on that lift. And even when he was like an old man, he was still able to lift some impressive weights. So to me, the natural guys, like Silver Era... Is the greatest of all time. I think they have the most aesthetic physiques. Uh, they're also really strong. I read this book 
few years ago, they were talking about overhead press competitions and the people in my weight class, bro, were overhead pressing like 245, something like that. This is in the early 1960s. So definitely impressive. Yo, Yash, you're, uh, you're lying, dude. You're literally, dude, are you, are you trolling me? Because I control f multiple times throughout this live stream. There's not a single question from you. Or is it getting blocked out by the algorithm? Re repost your question, dude. I I'm control f you. There's not one question from you. Unless you're writing something that's like really derogatory and YouTube is just picking it up. Because I don't see it. <laughs> you know? Algorithm blocking, maybe. It has to be that. Maybe, maybe that's why you've been trying all this time. Because I'm not doing anything, you know? I'd love to answer your question, but YouTube loves to censor certain things. <laughs> How do you feel about the trap bar overhead press? I don't have uh, a lot of experience with it. Uh, because it's annoying to get into the correct setup. Like, you gotta clean it up. And that freaking, <laughs> you know, the trap itself is gonna hit you in the face. So that's annoying. Uh, well, it won't hit you, but it, it can be in the way is what I'm saying. And when you're, if you want to lift the same loads, like 185 or anything like that, 135, it's, it's just a hassle getting to position, right? But in terms of the motion itself, it's good. Because unlike the Swiss bar, where the moment arm is more out in front, because you physically, like the only time it's going to be level with your body is when it's like past your head. The trap bar is to your side at all times. So you're already in. So you're just pressing in a vertical line, whereas the Swiss bar version, you're here. So the moment arm is absolute garbage in this position. That's why it's so hard. But then you got to shoot your head through. So just off that, man, trap bar is going to be easier with maybe the exception of the wide grip if you got shorter arms. So you're going to be more out here instead of here. But the joint angles are different. It's kind of like a behind the neck press without the shoulder damage, because it's a neutral grip as well. So you're not being forced into that crazy external rotation back here. Instead, you're just, boom. So it's it's a good lift in its own right. Um, I, I would say if you have longer handles or you're able to rack it or put on some blocks, then you got something that's freaking amazing. But <laughs> with the cleaning part, I'm not a fan. What time is it for you right now? Seven o'clock, homie. Uh, did you get your Swiss bar from Fitness Depot? I actually got it from Fitness Avenue. And I like it a lot, surprisingly, man. Because the Swiss bar I got there, not the Swiss bar, the uh, SSB squad was not good. I actually had to sell it. And now I use the one by Bells of Steel, which is the best I've ever used in my life. It beats anything I've tried in any freaking gym. Great quality, customizable. Bells of Steel, bro. Check them out. Hi, Alex. Would you consider doing a podcast with Ivan Jerk, the squad every day guy? Yo, man. I dig Ivan's channel a lot. He's extremely humble, real, gives great advice, showing his entire journey. I would love to chat it up with him one-on-one. -on -one. We can talk about more than just squats. Yeah, I talked about Insomnia before, man. When you rewatch this, you'll see it. Arch Nemesis Swiss Bar. I haven't tried that, but it kind of looks like the Kabuki Bar. So that's probably a good one right there. Okay, I'm going to answer three to five more questions because it's getting to be a long Q&A. And time stamping this is going to be <laughs> long. So let's do it. Okay, dude. Sob Rocker. Hey, man. How would you incorporate gymnastic rings in routine, time per week, and should you train skills? I like to use gymnastics for hypertrophy not training skills. So things like the iron cross or the planche on rings or even uh, front levers and back levers on rings, I don't program any of that stuff. Not only for myself, but for those that I work with. To me, it's all about using calisthenics to change the direction of resistance. So when we talk about the chest, for example, the main function is to bring the humerus across the body, right? And when you do things like regular way to push-ups, there is no converging effect, right? Therefore, you never really get to train the shortened position that much with the exception of diamond push-ups, just a little bit more. 
Now, when you add in gymnastic rings, you can set the straps up to your sides such that they're diagonal, right? This way, the starting position is going to be here, but when you end, so you're squeezing your pec muscles very hard, they're facing that way. So there's actual tension on the pec that you have to resist. So ring push-ups are really good as a bodybuilding motion. It's exactly what you do with cables. So you know when you have like uh, those freestanding cable stacks and you just adjust the height and you either stand forward or backwards, you either face the machine or you turn away, there's zero difference with gymnastic rings other than the fact that they could be a little bit unstable which you got to obviously build on and it's body weight base so that's what i use it for body weight calisthenics sorry <laughs> body weight bodybuilding man and uh, it freaking works like you guys get some rings you're not gonna regret it i use mine all the time same thing if you have like joint problems you know if you want if you don't if, like like let's say you want to do weighted pull-ups right and your shoulder or elbows are a bit achy on the gymnastic rings with the wide grip when you pull in the rings are gonna do this they're actually gonna rotate with you they're gonna come down to a certain extent instead of you like like it's not even possible <laughs> i can't even demonstrate it because with a bar like you're restricted right but with, with the rings they physically move in space so they're just easier on your build they're they're custom made for you is what i'm saying and depending how you set them up so for anyone who wants to minimize overuse and actually get more muscle gains through changing the direction of resistance, that is what you use them for. So you isolate your muscles, you do ring extensions, you do ring curls, you do one arm at a time, you do ring inverted rows because now you can actually have a super range of motion. Instead of you just stopping when the bar touches you, you go more than that. So the scapular retraction, it's like having that um, spreader bar that I recently got or, or even... Uh, you know, like Prime Fitness, they have these really good machines that are converging and you can really open up more. That's what the rings do, but they're cheap. Anybody can do them. Like one of the ultimate hacks for building mass. So that, that's what I do, it, man. Oh, Yashgami. I finally see your question, dude. We got to celebrate. All right, dude. Thank you for being patient with me, eh? <laughs> and maybe we could all answer this together in honor of you. I asked a speed power training question for sports, soccer, MMA, and powerlifting. Is separate training blocks with a focus on each trait better? If we're talking about the fastest progress possible, then yes, it is better. Dividing the stimulus will have less interference and therefore... You can allocate all of your recovery towards training those specific traits. But that also means you cannot maintain those abilities year round because there is a cycling process. You're going through different phases that cancel each other out in a sense. Like they're designed to work like you're moving on. But the thing is, when you get to the peak, when you get to the end of that phase, you literally have to jump off the mountain and redo it all over again. So whatever, if, if it took you three months to hit your peak performance for, say, soccer, like in a strength and conditioning aspect, uh, by month four, like when you start, when you redo the training cycle again, you won't be peaked anymore. So it, it allows you to hyper-specialize and be good for those times where you have competitions, you know? It, it's perfectly, like it gives you the best of the best performance, but you don't maintain it. And it can produce more injury, more overuse injuries because you're hitting the same repetitive motions. There's not there's not not as much variety within the system, and there's just like high specificity. Is like a race car, man. You can crash pretty easily. Whereas if you're more generalized, the process is going to be slower, but you kind of build everything at once. It's just going to take longer. And you don't really ever have a peak per se. You're, you're just like, you're there. You're, you're, you're chilling, you're doing okay. But the number one approach is obviously gonna be separating. But would I recommend that? For most people, no. You know, I, I think that concurrent periodization or just like mixing in multiple elements is fine for like 90% of you. 
you can get elite strength doing that. You can still be a, a hybridized athlete that excels at everything. Like a lot of this talk about interference is from milking those last few percentages of gains. It's very minimal in the grand context of things. So like there's optimal and then there's effective, right? The question is how much do those two things cross over? The answer is you, you can get far without being optimal. Very far. So look, if, if you want to see, now you respond. I've been doing generalized training with the odd block to bring up a weakness, but it's hard when I need to be explosive and strong at the same time. I was pulling four plates when I was 25 pounds lighter at 19. So you're talking about the explosiveness that's the problem? Because uh, I had a question before about dynamic effort. Like, honestly, dude, the conjugate training would be right up your alley. The conjugate system, because you can develop max strength year-round by doing the max effort method. Then there's a repetition method to bring up muscular weaknesses. And then dynamic effort is in three-week waves. So you never lose your explosiveness. Like, this is what I'd recommend to you. But if you want to do specific power blocks like that, that works as well. Just that it won't be maintained, you know? So to me, like, you don't have to compromise in that way, is what I'm saying. <laughs> All right. So I hope that trying to balance the training, you need to jump high and sprint quickly with the strength training. Dude, honestly, you should, con you cons you should consider conjugate because you can do that all. You just won't, you won't be the best at all those things, but it'll be generalized. And that's why I recommend it. But whatever, like, like if you just want to do a phase for like sprinting, for example, like that's obviously going to do more for you than trying to balance it out with this other stuff. So that'll be my answer to you on that, man. I'm all out of water. Thanks, I will give Conjugate a go. Awesome, dude, and let me know how you like it. Kyphotic lifting, can't break 600 off the floor. Jefferson and Hack, I would increase my squat to improve squat strength, but hernia bothers me only on squats, help me. Okay, yeah, the squat would actually help you a lot with that, so it's unfortunate you can't do it. I suppose my question would be, are you able to do hack squats? What about belt squats? Like, is it any type of squat where there's so much like internal bracing that you just can't do it. Another thing, like how are you able, okay, you can't break 600, but maybe you can break 585, right? How are you able to lift 585 on a quad bias lift and have your hernia not bother you, but then a barbell back squat is problematic. I don't really understand that correlation. Like, like you said, it's only the squat, but I just find it weird. Like, why is it only the squat, you know? <laughs> and is there nothing you could do? Is it an absolute, like, if you go above a certain weight, it's problematic? Because if the, if the response is, well, if I do heavy squats, my hernia bothers me, but not volume squats, then that could be really good too, you know? Like, if your max squat is 405, and you do 405 at uh, 70%, Okay, you said above 335 squat. So let's say 340. Let's say 350. You got 70%. That's going to be a 245 squat. So are you able to do three sets of 10 with 245? Oh, above 335 bothers me. Okay, okay. So dude, dude, you can still squat. Just do it for volume. Because look. Yeah, yeah, that's it, man. Hit like, I don't know what you're... What's your one rep max? You said above 335, you, you have problems, but you know what your, your estimated max would be? I just need a quick response so I can help you out, man. Probably 365, okay. So 365 at 70%. That's 255. So you can literally do 255 for three for like volume work, man. And that's gonna do a lot for your uh, leg drive and your hack squats. Like this is gonna help so much and you're still getting more out of less weight because it's nothing insane. It's not, the, it's not something you can't do. So I would do that and like, by the time you reach 335, like 335 minus, sorry, 335. 
minus 255. So you, you would have to increase your three sets of 10 weight by 80 freaking pounds. By the time that even happens, man, you're gonna surpass that 600 <laughs> hack dead. So even if you get like halfway there and then you're like, oh, I'm starting to notice this hernia, you're gonna be fine. You see what I'm saying? So that's why I wanted to know like what's the cutoff point? And I, and I hope that for other guys who are listening right now, it makes you realize that it's not the exercise in itself, it's percentages. You know, it's all about load management. If you figure that out, you can still include it and work around your current injuries. So I think like this right here was an excellent way to explain things. Yo, Alex, I've gone from a 14 to 6 inch neck in one year. This 18 inch neck, are you realistic goal for someone with average genetics? I think so, man. I, I've seen a lot of guys do it in my comment section. Like, I've probably seen that hundreds of times. Now, you can argue they're lying, but it's not impossible, man. Like, if we're talking about a flexed neck and you're a bit of a fluffier state as well, like 15, 20% body fat, like, it's totally doable. And you've already put on two inches on your neck. A lot of people, um, they go from 16 to 17 or 17 to 18. Like, it's not going to be a year anymore. Like, you already exhausted your newbie gains there. But, you know, you, you train your neck hard for the next three years. Like, I don't see 18 being unrealistic. Like, I don't. It's not like the arms, man. The arms, I, I cannot say that every person is going to hit 18, let alone 17. But the neck is just so much easier to develop. Like, it responds super easily, guys. It's crazy. Uh, how thick are your erectors? So, I got some thick spinal erectors. They're actually... Uh, the biggest they've ever been in my life. You know, I, I've never seen them pop out to this extent. And that's all due to the good mornings, man. I, last week I did 250 for three sets of 10. Like, fuck, we're getting strong on these. I wanna do 275 and then three plates. Once I can do three plates with that same like parameter, like it's gonna be crazy. So like watch the video I made talking about the uh, spinal rectors. I give a lot more information. Um, obvious Louis, yeah, my man, I appreciate your super chat. Obvious Lewis Carroll reference. After how much time would you reintroduce the main competition lift? How many variations would you do before retesting the main lift? So I would wait at least five to six weeks. Um, if you want to do it right, because ideally the more exercise variation, the better and overuse can kick in. If you try to redo the competition lift constantly, not to mention the fact that it can be psychologically demoralizing because maybe you're not gonna PR if you try to do it every fourth week, for example. To me, that's way too short term. And in my experience, like I, I gave you an answer, I said five to six, but the longer the better. And I'm now at the point where it's usually gonna be months spread apart. And for guys who wonder, well, isn't that going to make you weaker at the main lift? It won't because we're training the max effort method on a weekly basis and therefore the skill of maxing out is being developed. On top of that, we're still training the competition lift, just not for heavy singles. It's done through the volume work. So if I do a SSB squat on week one, I max out, I get 410, which I actually did recently, by the way. And now I use percentage back downs of that number. I can keep in that volume work for the next month or longer if I want and just do dynamic double progression on that. Like it doesn't, I don't have to swap out the competition lift for volume. So you're still training it in that way. You're just not going heavy on it. That's the difference. Also, even if you do theoretically swap it out, strength to strength. And if you add like 50 pounds to all your squat variations, it doesn't freaking matter. Like <laughs> when you go back to the comp style, you're going to be able to put up more weight. So the PRs are pretty much guaranteed and it forces you to be patient and just not feel beat up and like you're worth less. Because if, if you hit the same load or you regress ever so slightly or it's only a minuscule PR, like it doesn't feel good. But when you really like just said, screw it, I'm just gonna commit myself to this exercise rotation and then when you go back to it, you crush it. That hits hard, bro. 
Alex Hernandez, yo Alex, what's up? I have limited equipment and I'm planning on doing seated leg curls two times a week. What reps would you recommend? One three by 15, second three by 20. Honestly, dude, uh, I wouldn't even undulate like that. I, I would straight up do three sets of maybe 15 to 20 on both days. The thing is like, it all depends how heavy your machine goes and where you, like if you start to feel your knees on that movement, um, because keep in mind, it, it's a lot of guys, b because it's not your, your natural motion, if you go too heavy, it might cause problems anthropometry wise. Like, at least that's been my experience, but I don't want to overcomplicate by saying this. Most people generally stick to slightly higher reps, but there's nothing magical about that. You can do leg curls of eight reps, like three, three sets of six to eight and still gain muscle. It doesn't freaking matter at all. The only thing that must be factored in is proximity to failure. So if you're doing three by 10, three by 12, 15, 20, like as long as you're within one to three reps of failure, you're gonna gain all the hamstring muscle you need. There's no problems whatsoever. So, and it's such a small like movement that you do on the side that it doesn't, like you don't have to periodize this. It's a leg curl, dude. Especially the seated leg curl. That's the best way of doing it. Like it's such an efficient movement. <laughs> like I would periodize your RDLs and then just do classic bodybuilder work on those leg curls, you know? So the, the, the max that I would do, like if you're gonna split it up, is one day, three sets of eight to 12, and the second day, three sets of 15 to 20. But even then, you don't have to. It can be the same year round. Hazard, thank you for the super chat. Uh, Luis Montinaro, optimal body fat for weighted calisthenic strength. Honestly, the leaner the better. So. 15% is where I would cap it. But if you want to like display psych psychotic strength, I would say 12% is probably your sweet spot. Now, you can argue that being shredded is the best, but your recovery is going to be worse and you'll only be able to display certain feats of performance. So like your one arm pull up might go up. My question didn't get added. Yeah, repost it, man, because I'm wrapping this up, okay? Anyway, for calisthenics, if you're single digit, your one arm work is going to be easier, but your dips are going to suffer very hard. Your presses, your, your shoulders are going to take a beating. Maybe your elbows are going to hurt more when you do certain stuff. So it's like there's trade-offs, you know? So that's why like 12, you're still really lean, um, light of course, but you got enough reserves that you can recover from weighted calisthenics because it's, it's, it's not the same as only body weight like you're adding extra load on top of you it's like lifting weights at the end of the day if you do a weighted dip with four plates trust me that's gonna affect you so i don't think you should be excessively lean even though that's the best way to display performance in some cases not all what is a good lifetime goal for a total weighted chin up so i gave a standard of 300 pounds for bodybuilding purposes, I think that is what you guys should shoot for. Like in my experience of seeing many guys get strong, that's the number that seems to be most helpful. I suppose a lifetime goal would be 350, which is really insane, but anyone who could do that is gonna have a jack back. I can't think of that not happening. Is my question not showing? It's not, dude. Uh, well, hold on, I see it right here. Pain in major pectoral tendon, deep pain in between the front delt and chest when cross over the arms and flexing the pecs. Aha, uh -huh. after bench press. Aha, uh -huh. that's your AC joint, man. Most likely. You're talking right here. Like it's not on your pec or your front delt. It's right in the freaking middle. So that's cause. In, nine, nine, in most cases, dude, it's guys who bench with their arms way out here or it's too far out. So what I would tell you to do, dude, yeah, thumb away from the smooths, okay? So where the knurling is and the smooth part of the bar in the center, thumb away on each side and, oh, and you're very tucked in. Really now. What about your grip width? Are you using, are you using the, a moderate grip or is it excessively wide? Because that makes a difference. Because look, uh, I use a close grip, fudge, man, that's weird then, because usually that shouldn't even be happening, 
because it, it typically happens to guys who do uh, chest flies or really wide grip bench with the elbows high up. It, it's rare to hear someone getting that specific pain from a close grip tuck bench. So yeah, Hamza says fudge. Yeah, I say fudge too because I don't know what to say here. Um, maybe there's something wrong with your scapula humeral rhythm. Most likely his levers. Maybe you, you just have garbage leverages uh, for the bench press or your or your, your grip is too close. You know, some guys, um, they'll, they'll, so they're going to look at the barbell itself where, where the knurling is and they'll assume it's a one size fits all for everybody, right? So I, I gave you the example of thumb away from the smooths as like a general guideline, which typically works, but it's not universal, right? So if you got really short arms, and maybe you just grab on to the first part of the knurling, sorry, if you got long arms, you grab on to the first part of knurling, you might not be shoulder width. You're probably gonna be more in, so you're like that. So that could be causing problems. Uh, this Some people are saying you should see a doctor, get an x-ray. Uh, Thanks to my leverages, I got it from going close as well. Maybe too close is the problem. Maybe your upper back tightness is the problem. Maybe you don't even need upper back tightness. My arms are very long, elbows on the ground, but I don't have much pain in the bench. I emphasize rolling shoulders back. Okay, so you're emphasizing retraction, right? So how about I give you some unconventional advice and tell you to uh, stop doing retraction altogether, which might sound absolutely insane, but I would recommend you watch um, the video by Coach Kasim. Okay, N1 education, retraction. It might be in your case for your particular build. Watch this video, dude. There's, I would suspect, okay, that one, you're going too close, so you gotta widen it out a bit, and two, there's something off with your scapula, scapula humeral rhythm. I don't even know how to say that word, but the, it's those two factors, right? Combined with the anthropometry. Finally, I would recommend introducing um, weighted push-ups to work on the serratus. So maybe you, you don't really know how to protract, uh, or it's just on the bench where you have problems because there's something off with the pressing pattern itself. So those three things, I hope something in there would be helpful. But it, it's it's kind of hard because you kind of have you have the opposite situation. It's rare that you hear people getting pain. From that style, you know. Yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird one. Thanks for the help. I hope this helps, man. Let me know. All right, I think we're gonna end off on uh, this question right here. Hey, Alex, big fan here. Do you need to rotate variations for ring exercises over use wise since they can move and are more easy on the joints? So, in my opinion, Nadim. You have to rotate everything because high specificity, even on movements that are easier on the joints, can cause overuse. So this extends to all kinds of exercise that have a good stimulus to fatigue ratio. And, and rings are very good on that because you don't have to lift as heavy. Uh, and kind of the stability in itself will limit you from hurting yourself. Plus, as you said, they move with your anthropometry. But... I would change the setup on some movements. For example, if you do weighted pull-ups by say going from neutral rings to pronated at the top, so you're, you're, you're doing this, right? I would flip the rings upside down so that the strap is like rotating the opposite direction. This way, when you pull up, it's gonna force you into like a, an overly supinated position. So that's how you can get variety even though you're still doing like a similar movement pattern and there's still rotation going on, you're just changing the direction of rotation. Even the way you set up the straps, so there's 100% vertical and then there's two of your sides. You gotta mix in both, 100%. And um, the variations can also be mixing in weighted and non-weighted, which is, is, that's kind of like, <laughs> It's like, not a hack, but it's it's splitting hairs is what I'd call it, you know? Um, even changing your leverages. So instead of doing like decline 
extensions. You can flatten it out, maybe do higher repetitions. You got to do this stuff because overuse is the number one cause of injuries. And you can probably get away with it for a lot longer when using rings, but eventually it's bound to happen if you don't change what you're doing. And some, some guys actually do report golfers uh, elbow despite using them, you know? So I think that says a lot as well in the sense that we're not uh, entirely bulletproof, even with the best movements. So just, I, I hope something there was uh, helpful. And yeah. Huh. Okay, you know what? Screw it. I'm gonna end off on this question because I like it. All right? Thanks, man. Thanks. Good. Sukmandat. Alex, I've gone to 340 total weighted chin up with only 1.5 years of training. If I start training variations and isolate my biceps, you think 400 could be possible in 5 to 10 years? I really like how you phrase this because you're giving a long term duration and most people ask me questions like this, it's always a short term. Like, oh, I, I got this amount in one or two years. Do you think that in three years from now or next year or anything that's like nearby, could I get something crazy like 400 freaking chin? You said five to 10 years. So let me just say this, right? Irrespective of your amazing accomplishment, 340 total weighted chin up, you should be very proud of that. I'm sure your biceps already look pretty good despite that okay I would say if you had zero years of training experience if someone specializes in weighted chin-ups for the next decade like they go hard they watch my videos maybe they run the new program that's gonna come out they do they train like a street lifting athlete they do that they can probably get to that amount or super close to it or at least be way better than <laughs> they initially thought so in your situation in particular, 340 total body weight, that would be like, like let's say I do 340 divided by two. That's like doing 170 at 170. That is freaking good, dude. <laughs> like not long ago, that was my best. And you got there in 1.5 years. For me to go from three plates to four plates, that took about three years. So you seem more gifted than me, is what I'm saying. So just off that, you're gonna surpass your boy <laughs> um, in terms of like the time that it get that it takes to become super elite. And in a five to ten year zone, on top of that, bro, I, I don't even want to imagine how strong you're gonna be. But the thing is, aside from you, my man, <laughs> and you have you have long arms too. That's crazy. So you, you have good uh, pulling. You, you probably have a really jacked back. You're, you're like, you're torso dominant like me, which makes sense, you know? Anyway, for anyone else who's listening to me right now, just know that if you do 10 years of anything, you're gonna get results. 10 years of real specialization, whether it's bodybuilding, weighted calisthenics, powerlifting, whatnot, you're gonna have a great physique and be strong at exactly what you want. So I think that was a good way to end off today. Guys, this was an amazing Q&A. We covered so many things, over three hours, varied questions, every world. Yo, I'm very impressed. So uh, the next one is gonna be maybe in a month from now, a bit longer. I don't like to do these too frequently. But uh, I'm sure it's going to be awesome as well. Fire Q&A. Hell yeah, Adrian. Awesome Q&A. You know it, Tyler. Hamza, take care. You just missed it. Yeah, but don't worry. I'm going to timestamp everything. Yo, Yash, I appreciate you being patient for all these Q&As. You know, we finally figured out the problem. It was the algorithm. <laughs> so much love. I'm going to answer more of your questions next time. Nice one, Alex. Have a good one. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Matt. See you, Jeff. See you, The Revo. Always great advice. That's what I try to do, man. Have a good Easter. Yeah. Everyone who's uh, celebrating, enjoy. Spend some time with your family, you know. Have good food. Happy Easter. Take care, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, man. Yo, thank thanks. 
I thank every single one of you for being with me today. Yeah, I had a really good time and uh, the questions were fantastic. Thanks for all, absolutely. All right then, guys. I'm signing out. You have a good one. See you in about a month.